Hello, 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 my friends. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, February 9th. And even though this is not a normal scheduled support group meeting day, I am totally in the mood to do a support group meeting. So I thought I'd pop online, see how everybody's doing. And I've got some good information for you. So let's just see if people, you know, need help today. I am right now printing out a presentation I want to do for you, but let's just get an idea and see what might be happening. Hi, YouTube. So you guys, if I'm, hello, Barbara, nice to see you. So if I'm looking up, I'm looking at Facebook, if I'm looking down, I'm looking at YouTube, just trying to get everything set up. Hello, Ruth. I don't know what's going on with Facebook right now. Facebook is a little on the slow side. Am I doing this in the right place, Facebook? Hmm. Let's hope so. Hi, hello, Danielle. Nice to see you. Alrighty then. Just trying to get my computer set up, my friends. Ooh, hey, Patty. Patty says she's doing better today. Yeah, baby. I love it. Hello, Lisa. How are you? Lisa, thank you for answering. Lisa says, thank you for answering my email and providing the estrogen chat. I know I read, I need to redo all of my educational videos. It's one of the things I want to do this year for sure. Hello, Marie Chantel. Hello, David. Hello, April. Hi, nice to see you. Hi, David. Can you explain what pelvic floor therapy is? Yeah, absolutely. Pelvic, so, uh, and actually, that's actually one of the things I'm printing out right now, a little presentation I'm going to do for you. Um, your pelvic floor muscles are the muscles which support the structures in your pelvis. Okay. And so, I mean, if you think about it, the pelvic area from your hip bone to your hip bone, from your crotch to your waist, that's kind of, I'm a little bit lower than the waist, but that's basically your pelvis. Your pelvis is the buffer for the human body. It is what carries the weight of your torso. It is what absorbs the weight that's pushed up your legs when you walk, right? And so there's a lot of work happening in the pelvis. There's muscles that help you walk, help you open your leg to the side, drop your legs open, open your legs, walk, you know, move, all that sort of stuff. Then, of course, we've got a lot of nerves happening in the pelvis. So we've got nerves from the spinal cord that go all the way down, down to the sacrum, the lower part of the spinal cord. And then they also uh, extend off of the spinal cord through the pelvis, down the legs and to various structures. And so for many patients with, quote unquote, interstitial cystitis, what we have learned is, in fact, they have muscle injuries, pelvic floor muscle injuries. If you have fallen, if you have fallen, for example, on your tailbone badly, that creates the perfect foundation for an injury to the levator anal muscles. So pelvic floor physical therapy is basically working with those muscles. The challenge is those muscles are internal. So it's pretty hard to get to them from the outside. So the best way to reach the pelvic floor is going to be either vaginally for a woman or rectally for a man. And I'm going to explain this. It's really, really important. Hello, Andrea. Nice to see you. You've been doing your pelvic stretches? Yeah. Um, what do they do? Oh, you know what? Hold on a sec. I left my notes. I left one set of my notes. Hi, Trudy. Trudy says, thanks for being there. Being here for you guys? Absolutely. Hi, Thamara. Hi, Sophia. Hi, Anne. And scheduled for a cystoscopy on Wednesday. And we should talk about that. Is it a plain cystoscopy in the office or is it, is it a hydrodistension with cystoscopy? Do we know? Do we know? Okay, while you're doing that, I got to go get something out of my briefcase. I'll be right back. All right, here I am, here I am. Ugh. I'm in writing mode right now because I'm trying to, we're trying to finish up our winter magazine. So this is my Hello laptop that I use when I go to the coffee, to the coffee shop to get away from the phone so I can actually write something. And of course, what I'm working on right now, this is this book. Read it twice so far and my notes for this book. Okay, so um, we are going to be doing, I'm going to be giving away two of these books at the end of this meeting. 
uh, these, uh, I, I got a lot, a lot of good news. So like, number one, I, I reached Dr. Weiss. Yeah. Oh my God. He's retired. I mean, it's very, very private. And I was very, very lucky that I sent him a letter of thank you for this fabulous new book that I think is absolutely the best book ever written on IC. And he has agreed to an interview. I'm going to need your help today coming up with questions for him. I have been working on that for a day. I want this to be the best ever interview ever, 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 because his information is so incredibly important. Um, and also, 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 guess what? I get to buy them in volume. So these are costing $35 on Amazon. We're going to be able to sell them through the IC network for at least $5 less. And they're already on the way to us. And so I'm, I, I've already bought 21 copies of these at full price. Uh, but I'm, I'm really, really happy that I'm going to be able to get these for you more affordably. All right. If you want the print version. So let me introduce myself. My name is Jill Osborne. If you've never seen one of these before, I am the national IC support group leader. I've been a support group leader for 27 years as of the start of this year, which I find absolutely crazy. I bring three college degrees to the table, a degree in chemistry, a degree in drug development, pharmacology, master's in psych, a master's degree in psychology. I gave up pharmacology because I love animals and I could not tolerate the animal research, which is absolutely disgraceful in my opinion. Um, and so I moved into psychology, got my master's degree, got a presidential fellowship from the White House, and then bam, I see it, bam everything stopped. And the IC Network, which is our website, icnetwork.org, was actually my doctoral dissertation proposal on how to bring support to somebody who was homebound because I was homebound. Guys, my IC pain was so bad that first year, 1992, like middle of 1992 to the middle of 1993, I could barely walk. I was a patient who had a chemical burn to my bladder. That was what triggered my bladder pain for the first time. And so as much as I wanted to get that doctorate in psychology, I couldn't because I couldn't, I couldn't sit in a freaking car for five years without crying. Oh my God, my mother's Dodge, she had a Dodge sedan, used to destroy me. Like I'd be bawling my eyes out after 15 minutes from the vibration in the car. My, my dad's Crown Vic, I could do for a little bit longer. Um, and we should at some point in time talk about how to pick a car. I don't have those issues now. That was with a fresh injury. And the theme here is injury. That's something we're really going to be talking about today. Okay, so what are these support group meetings? These are live stream meetings directly in your home. My goal is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, so informed that no one can ever mess with you again. No one can say to you, I see it's all in your head. Screw them. Screw them. I'm going to give you the ammunition that you need so that you can counter that argument successfully, right? I want you to walk into a doctor's office with your head held high. There's no shame. There's no blame here. It's not your fault you got hurt. I want you to be able to talk face to face with a doctor. I want you to be able to have a good informed discussion about your treatment options. I don't want you to walk into a doctor's office crying. I don't want you to walk into your doctor's office and say, I don't know what to do. Do anything. I don't care. Seriously, not good enough. Not good enough. Now, listen, it really, really sucks that you feel so awful and you've got to be your own advocate. It sucks. It sucks that you're at home crying, begging for somebody to stop and help you. And I know that I was there. I slept on my living room floor for years at night crying because I, because the pain was so bad from my chemical injury. So I get it, but ultimately in the end, you have to remember the human body is wired to heal. The challenge is we often get in the way, number one. Number two, we don't understand what the injury is and or the illness if you've got Hunter's lesions or maybe a chronic infection. Um, and, and number three, it takes, um, uh, gosh, what's, what word am I looking for here? Um, there's a point where you go from passive to active. And for me, I will tell you exactly when it happened. This is about a year after my diagnosis. I had no pain medication. I lost my job. 
I lost my boyfriend. I was living at home with my parents who were taking care of me because I couldn't even sit in the car without crying. And I was at the emergency room one day. And I had a doctor say to me, you will forever be a burden on your family. You will always have pain. This is your life. Get used to it. And I went, what? What? He said, this is your life. Get used to it. I was so pissed off. I went, wait a second. Wait a second. I still have my brain. I still have my hands. I still have my intelligence. I have an incredible determination to get better. I will prove you wrong, you son of a bitch. How dare you say that to me? Three months later, I started my first support group from my bed. A year later, I started the IC Network, rated number one in the world by Harvard Medical School and the University of London for accuracy, reliability, credibility. This is my job. I read IC every day. But more importantly, I am proof that you can get better because I am better. I don't live with pain anymore. It's rare that I have bladder pain. Every now and then I flare from something. But a lot of that has to do now. My bladder is completely healed from the original injury, and we have proof of that. But I am older now. I have uh, my bladder is a little bit more vulnerable because of uh, menopause. So I'm not going to be doing a lot of cranberry juice. Cranberry juice is the acid bomb. But again, the human body is wired to heal. Healing can happen. Our challenge is we got to understand the nature of the injury, the type of the injury, uh, and or whatever else is going on, so that we can find the right therapy for you. You know, you got to understand 10 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 40 years ago. Well, a little history lesson. I see was first described in the middle 1800s in England in a medical journal. If you read that patient report back then, it's perfect for today. Patient with frequency, urgency, pressure, pain. And uh, they called it Tic de la Rue of the bladder. I don't remember what Tic de la Rue stands for, to be quite honest. Okay, then in the 1920s, a guy, a doctor named Guy Hunter invented the cystoscope, allowed people to look inside the bladder. And when he looked inside the bladder, what did he see? He saw big bloody red spots, which we now call Hunter's lesions after his name. And then, you know, from the 20s, 30s, 40s, up to almost the mid 50s, we had a lot of good research studies coming in. We had research showing that this affected men. We had research studies showing that this affected women. There was a real robust discussion about quote unquote interstitial cystitis. And then bam, I think it was 1952, might have been 1954, somewhere in there. A couple of doctors published a case study in a medical journal in which they claimed that a woman, a single patient with interstitial cystitis had quote unquote unexpressed anger manifested in the pelvis. And those idiots condemned the IC IC world and patients in the IC world to four years, 40 years of an assumption that IC was all in your head because they had the audacity to suggest that a woman with frequency, urgency, pressure, pain had an issue, a mental issue. Imagine how that woman felt in their care. It's un, you know, the tragedy of tragedies with that assumption that just because a doctor couldn't see it, remember doctors are taught to diagnose by, in most cases by sight. But when you look at us, you don't necessarily see dysfunction. You might be able to see wounds in the bladder, but you don't necessarily see some of the other things going on. So anyway, so fast forward, you know, from 1952 to about 1987, uh, medical schools thought that IC was an emotional hysterical condition. And we've had several doctors, slightly older doctors now, who shared how they were introduced to IC. Dr. Dan Brookoff, one of the nation's pain, med- pain medicine specialists, who was the pain specialist for IC for many, many years before he passed away, often shared how he was introduced to IC in medical school. He was at a one-day seminar on urology conditions, and literally at the very end of the day, as the speaker was packing up his notes, 
on uh, he goes, oh, there's one more condition I need to tell you about. It's called interstitial cystitis. It's going to drive you crazy. These patients are going to drive you crazy because all they're going to do is call you over and over and over again. And then, and then he said, you know, he, he just basically said, how do you treat it? Now, remember, this was back in the 80s. Uh, you just take their bladder out. Uh, but he also said it was all in their heads, but then you take their bladder out. And one of Dan Burkhoff's young interns who was sitting next to him raised his hand and said, but wait a second, if it's all in their head, why would you take their bladder out? And of course, the speaker didn't know how to answer that. And, you know, it was over. So here, Dan Burkhoff was, was told that this was a medical condition you didn't want to treat. Okay. But you know what? A lot of fantastic things have happened since then. This is a good time right now. Because in 1987, with the help of the Interstitial Cystitis Association and the encouragement of them, the National Institutes of Health created their first diagnostic criteria for IC. And slowly but surely, interstitial cystitis received, again, kind of credibility. And then we had money put into it. In fact, $100 million of federal research money here in the United States was put into the study of IC, if you didn't know that. It's an amazing investment in the IC patient community. And what do we know from about 1985 to about 2005? Okay, so, so we had some good money coming in. We had uh, research studies that were starting to show that some therapies work, like Elmeron. Elmeron was approved in 1996, yada, yada, yada. But here's the deal. As a support group leader back then, since I started in 1993, it was really clear that a one treatment fits all approach didn't work. Elmer didn't work for everybody. Why? Y'all are saying this is a bladder disease. Why wouldn't a bladder therapy work for everybody? And that was really a great mystery. And many of you, for those of you who are older, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where they gave you therapies over and over and over again. They didn't really work. But then something amazing happened. The federal government launched something called the MAP Research Network, the Multidisciplinary Approach to the Study of Pelvic Pain. This dynamic research team studying chronic pelvic pain, IC, and chronic prostatitis. And their data and their studies have been exemplary. So they, for example, um, were ones who discovered that some patients having flares have fungal infections. Uh, they did heredity studies. They've done biome studies. They've done all sorts of really, really good things. And then also we had a renegade rogue physical therapist named Rhonda Cotterinos, who still practices in the Chicago area, who started coming to IC National Institutes of Health meetings and railing at these doctors, hey, hey, you all talk about patients having super, super tight muscles. What are you doing about it? If you give those patients to me, a physical therapist, I bet I can make them better. And they kind of laughed at her. And in fact, I was at the meeting where they finally gave her a podium session because slowly doctors were admitting, yeah, patients have tight muscles. Uh, they finally gave her a podium session at the end of one meeting, and most of the doctors walked out before she even talked. Ironically, ironically, she was right. She was right. Um, and she's the one who started this tremendous movement now that has helped us understand that bladder symptoms can come from outside of the bladder. The pelvis is a very small confined area. You got hip to hip, uh, you got a hip to hip. And think about in your pelvis, what's happening? You got muscles from your belly coming down. You got muscles from your legs coming up, crammed in there. You got organs, you got your intestine, you got your bladder for women, you got your vagina for men, you got your things going on there. And we've got nerves and blood vessels and all that stuff in a very, very small confined space. And um, as Dr. Weiss really rightly points out, Western medicine focuses on compartments, 
on structures. A urologist works with the bladder. A gy gynecologist works with your reproductive organs. Uh, and in, a gastroenterologist would work with your bowel. And he argues very, very successfully that that really doesn't apply in the pelvis because there's too many interrelationships, okay? And so we now know that muscles, muscle dysfunction can trigger bladder symptoms. And we knew in 2008, getting back to my timeline here, so in 2008, the National Institutes of Health released their first pelvic floor physical therapy study about IC. It was a big multinational study done at clinics all around the United States. And guess what? Pelvic floor physical therapy worked. And it worked better than pretty much any other therapy ever studied for IC. So when that study came out in 2008, what do you think happened? The IC world turned on its head. Because up to that point, everybody's going, this is a bladder disease. But then we've got this incredibly validated National Institutes of Health study that comes out and says, yeah, but pelvic floor physical therapy works for a ton of patients. And everybody at that moment stopped. And everybody about at that moment went, hmm, well, if this is a bladder disease, why would muscle therapy work? Why? Doesn't make sense. And everybody went, oh, hmm. Could it be that for some patients, their symptoms are being driven by their muscles? And clearly now, we know, uh, 12 years later, that's absolutely true. So that was a spectacular thing that happened in 2008. But then, but then something else happened. And that was about eight or nine years ago. And that is that, again, a one treatment fits all approach doesn't work, right? So Elmeron didn't work for people. And yeah, there was a small group of patients that pelvic floor physical therapy didn't work for either. And if there's one thing we know about the IC patient community and about you guys out there watching this right now is that this is a very diverse and robust patient population. So for some of you, IC begins in childhood. For others, IC begins after menopause. Are they the same? You got the same diagnosis? The answer is no, they're not the same. For some of you, IC begins after a car accident or a fall. For others, IC begins after chemical exposure like chemotherapy. You're both diagnosed with IC, but are you the same? No, you're not. And I remember years ago, Dr. Drew did an interview. We all got very, very pissed off because uh, he suggested that IC was a grab bag diagnosis. And we felt that that was very, very minimizing. But in fact, he's kind of right. It is kind of a grab bag diagnosis. If you've got frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, and they don't really know where it's coming from, you're probably going to get diagnosed with IC. Uh, but what the top doctors in the world now are doing is they're focusing on trying to understand your unique variation of IC. Because it wouldn't make sense for you to spend $50,000 on Elmeron if your problem is in fact a, a muscle issue, just like it wouldn't make sense for you to endure two years worth of physical therapy if your problem is a hunter's lesion. So what doctors around the world are doing now is something called phenotyping or subtyping. And there's this pretty big kind of competition among them to see who is going to create the perfect subtyping system. So in Europe, there's 16 subtypes, 16 variants of IC, and that's the European Society for the Study of IC, who we really owe a debt of gratitude for doing that years ago, 10 years ago. In Canada, they use something called U-Point to create a whole picture of, of your body. Um, and in the U-Point system, you know, they check your bladder. They want to look at your bladder, see if there's anything funky going on. They want to look at your symptoms, try to understand your symptoms. They want to study your muscles. They want to look at the presence of infection. They want to look for the presence of any other neurologically dr driven conditions. And they also want to look to see if you've got, if you're somebody who struggles with anxiety and stress, because that also can trigger some frequency urgency. So based upon that system, they can create a customized treatment protocol. 
Now, in the United States, we don't necessarily have an agreed upon national system. And it's interesting. And again, I really blame that on competition among the doctors and the researchers. Um, um, if there's one thing everybody can agree on is that Hunter's lesion patients are their own unique group. Everybody in the world understands that. But there is kind of pros and cons about subtyping. Some doctors are saying, don't rush to subtype. Others are saying, oh my God, this is helping us tremendously. Um, I use a subtyping system that was created by Dr. Christopher Payne, who ran the IC research program at Stanford University for 25 years. And I think his subtyping system is spectacularly successful, although we're going to be changing it based upon some of the new information we've gotten in this book. But hold on a sec. To get out, I have to get out my slides. I have sli I have a new set of slides I'm going to share with you today. So, so my friends, so in the pain subtyping system, which was created five years ago, he proposed five variants of IC. Okay, five variants of IC. He's now at Vista Urology in San Jose. He's practicing with his wife Jeanette Potts, who's also a pelvic pain specialist. So Vista Urology is the pelvic pain center of Northern California right now. Um, and so his five core variants are, number one, Hunter's lesions. The reason why Hunter's lesion patients are, very, are completely different from everybody else is that when you biopsy a lesion, it is filled with inflammation. There's a war going on in Hunter's lesion patients' tissues. Um, uh, inflammation means your body's fighting something, that there is a there is a very strong physiological response to whatever's happening in a lesion. And we know lesions, for example, don't respond to bladder therapies like Elmeron. They just don't. Um, it might protect it a tiny bit, but it's not necessarily going to heal it. What's going to heal a lesion is going to be either cauterizing the lesion, uh, although that's technically not healing the lesion, it's killing the lesion. Uh, they can inject a steroid into the lesion. You can do hyperbaric oxygen therapy to flood the system with oxygen that will help those tissues heal. Or Lyris, and that's a whole other story, which is the first treatment in history that has healed lesions. It's just not available right now, unfortunately. So subtype number one, Hunter's lesions. <clears throat> subtype number two, bladder wall driven. Because hello, the bladder can be hurt just like any other part of the body. Usually it's hurt through some sort of chemical exposure. So if you've gone through chemotherapy, you would have chemocystitis. That would be a real chemical injury. Or in my case, I also had a chemical injury from a swimming pool accident with pool chemicals. Uh, ketamine would be something that would do it. If you just only drank soda for years and years and years or coffee or things like that, you know, that massive acid load on that bladder wall is eventually going to take a toll and start to break down the bladder, right? But bladder wall driven can also be the result of infection. So if you have a chronic fungal infection, if you have a chronic bacterial infection, uh, this would be in this potential subtype. And we're going to come on to that. And I have a product reveal. I mean, if you guys, please, please remind me to come back to infection in about a half hour because I have a, a new product to share with you that's very, very exciting. Okay. So if you have pain as your bladder wall, bladder is filling with urine that is relieved by urination, that points us to your bladder wall. That means that, that you either have Hunter's lesions or you've got something going on with your bladder wall. And of course, what we also have to throw in here is going to be estrogen atrophy menopause, right? Because your body needs an, 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 uh, estrogen to produce mucus. And if you don't have mucus, your tissues get drier and can't protect themselves. So every older woman knows that things start to dry out. And when they you think about dry mouth, when, you know, your mouth is meant to be moist. When you have dry mouth, it hurts. What do you do? You drink water to try to moisten it. Well, dry vulva, dry vagina, dry urethra, dry, dry bladder hurts. That's estrogen atrophy. Okay, we talk about that later. I got a good video on our website on that called the estrogen chat. I see subtype uh, three is pelvic floor driven. These are the patients whose symptoms began after a muscle trauma a car accident, a fall, a fall on your tailbone. 
a history of athletics, if you were a ballerina, if you were a football player, if you were a paratrooper, if you sat for long periods of time, or if you were a victim of sexual abuse, pelvic floor muscles matter. Pelvic floor muscles directly influence the health of your bladder and other organs. And I'll be getting back to that in a minute. I see subtype four is pudendal neuralgia. Sorry, you know what? My chair is all, all squirmy right now. If I'm squirmy, that's right. why I've got a new chair. I see subtype four is pudendal neuralgia. These are patients who have a nerve injury. So for them, their symptoms are usually positional in nature. They're fine when they stand, but when they sit down, it hurts. Listen, if you, ha if you have tremendous pain when you sit down that is relieved by standing up, you have a nerve injury. And that's usually because you have very, very tight muscles. If you have sciatica, pain shooting down your leg, you have a nerve injury. I know that because I have sciatica too. Okay. And so for these patients, our treatment is going to be focused on calming and soothing that nerve and trying to figure out why that nerve is triggered, which again, is usually from tight muscles. And then last and, la last and not least, whoops, uh, using the pain system, we have central sensitization. Okay, so the, this is the inherited subtype. This is also one of my subtypes. Hello, redhead from Norway, super sensitive skin. Patients who uh, patients with central sensitization have nerves that are easier to trigger, nerves with a lower action potential slash nerve threshold. And so it's characterized by having super sensitive skin like I do. It's crazy, especially as I'm getting older, but it's been my whole life. I've had sensitive skin. We have drug sensitivity where a normal dose of a medication doesn't work for us. We have to take half doses or baby doses. We have food sensitivity. There's just foods that don't work in our body, not just, not just our bladder, our whole body. For me, chocolate kills me. Oatmeal. Hello. What's one thing everybody says you can all eat oatmeal? Not me. I cannot eat oatmeal. It gives me bowel spasms. It's crazy. That's central sensitization for me. Uh, we are extremely chemically sensitive. Um, we have a wicked sense of smell. We can smell things that other people cannot smell. And smells drive us absolutely batty at times. Um, we might even have hearing sensitivity where if there is, a uh, like for me, if there's an animal crying, it drives me, I, I just, I cannot not hear it. And I have to fix that animal. I've got to find that animal. You might even have visual sensitivity where if there's a funky pattern in a carpet or a wallpaper, or if you go into a store and you're kind of overloaded by the visual sensation of all the cans in the shelf and you have to close your eyes and turn away, that also is central sensitization. So for these patients, our, our therapeutic priority is going to be to, number one, not be aggressive and provocative. The last thing we want to do is trigger those nerves and make them worse. So a lot of doctors are going to back way off with somebody who's got central sensitization. They're really probably not going to want to do aggressive testing at first. Because um, the last thing we want to do is trigger that nervous system and create any more pain generators. And then the other key with this one is to... Let's say, uh, uh, um, I'm gonna use me an example. So I've got wicked sensitive skin. Uh, if we go back to when my IC started, my bladder was screaming, my bowel was screaming, uh, my skin was screaming and, you know, and throw in any ra random chemical, you know, I was just a wreck. The approach for sens central sensitization is you address all of the pain generators. We have to turn the volume down on the nervous system. We can't just treat the muscle and the vulva and ignore the bladder. Just like we can't, we can't ignore the vulva, the vulva screaming. As long as there's something triggering the nervous system, uh, that patient is going to struggle with, with systemic sensitization. But we also know, we also know that when the volume is turned down, central sensitization calms way down. And I also am fairly living proof of that. Okay. Let me get a drink water here real quick. Oh, this is my, this is our pumpkin spice rubose tea. Very, very bladder friendly. Okay. So this has been my favorite teaching tool for the last five years. And when you think about those subtypes, 
what do you think is the biggest subtype? Now we can throw out, we can throw out right away, we can throw out Hunter's lesions because we know that really only five to 10% of patients have Hunter's lesions. So the rest of us would have either bladder wall injury, pelvic floor injury, or nerve injury or central sensitization. Which do you think would be the biggest subtype? You know, now most of you are going to say the bladder. And I'm going to say, no, it's not. It's not the bladder. In fact, the bladder might, you know, the bladder, I, I, you know, we need to do a study on this because I'm going to guess that probably 70% of IC patients have muscle injury. That's going to be my guess. Yeah, Patty. So Patty down on YouTube says pelvic floor. Don down on YouTube also says pelvic floor. And you guys, um, I have my Facebook screen really small, so I'm really not seeing your comments. Hi, Sophia from Cyprus. Gigi says, I fell on my tailbone area a number of years before I started my IC. Would that affect your IC? Absolutely. And I'm going to explain exactly why next. Hi, Trisha. Thank you. Yes, I'm having a great day because I'm here doing what I love to do. Okay, so what's changed? So what's changed? You know, I mean, so we're long past the bladder only thing. And now we're kind of long past the bladder pelvic floor because we know nerves can be involved and other things can be involved. So what's the next step? I mean, I, and I guess, you know, I always say to patients, we've got the chicken versus the egg dilemma. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor? Or for vulvodynia patients, the vulva or the pelvic floor? And the reality is, is they're both involved because they're both so interconnected. But one is normally driving the other. And so when I work with patients on the phone, you know, I do a lot of coaching for patients on the phone, wellness coaching and things like that. We spend a lot of time going back in history. It's like, okay, when did your symptoms begin? Begin, And what was happening around that time? And in almost every case, we can point right back to some sort of pelvic trauma. And yet patients are really baffled by that, but it's my bladder. Why would my bladder wall be red and irritated if it's my muscle? That doesn't make sense, Jill. I don't believe you. This is the next step. This is what I want to explain to you. So this brand new book, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain, written by Dr. Jerome Weiss, is a mind-blowing gift to the IC community. Um, and as I said, when I started this meeting, I have connected with him now. Um, it turned out he worked on this book for 15 years, and he retired last year. It is an absolute love story to patients. His goal with this book is to create a kind of a treatment plan for you or a, a plan to follow or ideas to explore. He doesn't want you sitting in your room crying, thinking that there's no hope. And this book is just filled with discussion of the anatomy, you know, so that you really, really, really understand how the structures in the pelvis interrelate to each other. Uh, like, for example, when you think pelvic floor muscles, you think, okay, they're flat muscles at the bottom of the pelvis. And it's true. You've got levator anal muscles that basically extend from the front of your body back to your tailbone. Those are your levator anal muscles. But what he says in this book is actually your pelvic floor is like a three-sided open box. So think box, you know a box that's open towards the front. No, no, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, and so yes, we have muscles along the base of the pelvis, but we also have muscles along the sides, along the back side, and the front is open, right? So you've got piriformis muscle and obturator muscles that are, that are the upper muscles compared to the lower flat muscles. He talks a lot about nerves. He explains and shows, the pictures are amazing. It shows you how nerves go through the muscles. And if that muscle is screwed up, guess what? It's gonna be impacting that nerve and it's gonna be affecting that nerve. Um, he's the first to offer a, you know, now granted I knew this, but I didn't, 
I, I knew this at some point in time for my reading in IC, somewhere 10 years ago. I knew that muscles that were damaged could impact nerves. But the question is, is how does that cause a breakdown of the bladder wall? It's like, yeah, your muscles are tight. You know your muscles are tight, but why the hell is your bladder red? Why are you food sensitive? That's, that's a crazy thing. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Let me leave this out because I'm sure I will have some pictures to share with you. Let's see if I can find it. There's one picture in particular. Ooh. Yeah, that's a good picture right there. Okay. So let's look at, let's consider for a moment what Dr. Weiss says. So here we go. Breaking through, I should have made this in black, darn it. Uh, Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain by Dr. Jerome Weiss. Okay, that's the book. And again, you'll be able to get it through the IC network next week for $5 less than Amazon. So, all right, hold, oh, darn it. It printed two sides. Well, that was my mistake. Hold on a sec. Now I got to find the, hold on. Okay. Ah, okay. Oh man, I got to reprint these out without two-sided printing. Okay. So let's, let's ponder the moment here. Okay. So, so let's go back to the young, young man I worked with who, whose symptoms started immediately after sliding in his socks on a slippery wooden floor at the top of a stairs. His feet flew out from underneath him landed on his butt and then he went down the stair wooden stairs on his butt so he hit the tailbone how many times eight nine ten times his symptoms started immediately after that trauma so this is the sequence of events that dr weiss says is happening number one you get a muscle injury of some type okay so you have fallen on your pelvic floor. And in this case, the guy who fell on his tailbone, obviously there's direct trauma to bony structures, but there was direct trauma also to the muscles around his tailbone. Okay. So that's step number two. So then you kind of ask, okay, so you fell, what's the big deal? Yeah. It hurts a little bit. You rub it out, you move on. What happens to the muscle when you fall and you traumatize that muscle badly what is the legacy in that muscle dr weiss argues that it is the development of trigger points in the muscle muscle knots but there are two types of muscle knots there's a latent muscle knot and an active muscle knot and so what he says in this book is anytime you sustain a significant muscle injury, you have to kind of assume at that location, you now have a muscle knot. You know, muscle fibers slide. This is the way your muscles are built, right? Your muscles are built, your muscle fibers are built to slide like this. So when they're, when they're long and loose and pliant, they're kind of like this, and then they slide together when you need tension, when you pop a, you know, when you pop a bicep or when you're squatting down, this is what the muscles do. And then of course they relax. But when a muscle is traumatized, sometimes what happens is they slide together and they lock and you end up with a muscle knot now. And let's, so let's say you fell as a kid a couple of times, you jammed your crotch on the bar of a bicycle as I certainly did. I remember falling and actually breaking the tip of my tailbone off because I could feel it in my butt. I could feel it moving around in my butt for, you know, a good couple of months. So here we have a series of traumas to muscles. And at each location, we now have a trigger point. So let's think about what, it, what happens with a trigger point. Let's see, is that the right one? Hold on. Okay. 
So I want I want to see if I can show. Let's see if I can show this to you. So here is this is a normal muscle fiber, right? So you got this muscle, you got this muscle, and in between the muscles, you've got blood vessels supporting the health of the muscle. And then bam, look at this. You have a trigger point. You have a muscle knot. And because that knot is wide and flat and thick, what does it do? It interferes with the blood vessels, the blood vessels in the area. So what does that mean? That means that the muscles cannot are not going to be as healthy as they could be. Okay. Um, and and this this is this part's going to be hard for me to explain. Um, okay. So when you've got a trigger point, this is what happens. You get a compression of blood vessels right? And then you also get potentially a compression of nerves. And that's what sciatica is. Sciatica is a compression of the sciatic nerve as that nerve is extending through uh, the piriformis muscle. And so you've got a tight muscle and it's squeezing blood vessels, but it's also squeezing nerves. And when you move into a certain position, like you sit down, you're compressing that nerve, which causes that. And he goes into kind of the metabolics of muscle dysfunction and how, uh, what that does to the nerves. So at the biological level, we have to look at this picture. We have to kind of look at this picture. So again, here you go. We've got our muscle knot and we've got it hitting, uh, uh, hitting a nerve this time. Now, then we have to kind of understand how nerves work because nerves, you know, when people think about a nerve, they think it's electric and it is kind of electric, but it's actually driven by ions. It's driven uh, uh, by calcium and it's driven by other things. And so whenever you have a nerve that's, that's moving from one direction to another, there's a very quick cascade of chemicals along that, neuro, that, that uh, neuron. And so what he says here is, unfortunately, what happens is that when the, when the muscle fiber becomes weakened and it's not getting the blood flow that it needs, it cannot, the nerve itself starts to malfunction. So, so again, this is a little bit more complex that um I want to get this right. So if we go back to this, let's go back to these muscle fibers for a moment. Okay. So when a when a fiber contracts to function normally, it releases calcium. Is a spontaneous, I mean, it's not spontaneous, it just happens, that's just the way it works. Calcium gets released, but then calcium is supposed to get immediately reabsorbed. But when calcium does not get immediately reabsorbed, calcium cannot be immediately reabsorbed if the muscle is damaged. The muscle does not have the blood supply that it needs due to the muscle not to reabsorb the calcium. So we end up with basically kind of what he calls sick muscles and sick nerves. Um, so what happens then? So now we've got trigger points in your body. We know that it's damaging blood flow. We know that those muscles are weaker. We know now that the nerves are being traumatized and the nerves are trying to function. They're trying to release they're releasing the neurotransmitters to be normal, but your body is anything but normal. And then at some point in time, an event happens, which turns your latent trigger points that, you know what, they were there, but they didn't really affect you that much, but they were certainly creating a foundation of dysfunction. You get the straw that breaks the camel's back. There is some sort of trauma 
whether it's a physical trauma or whatever that turns it all on. So if you were a gymnast or a ballerina or a football player, we know you sustained a whole bunch of pelvic injuries and you probably had, had a bunch of trigger points in your pelvis in your early 20s, but you didn't really have any issues. But then you had a baby and you had a difficult delivery with that baby. That, would have, that could have been a trigger that turned your silent trigger points to active trigger points to, well, to painful trigger points. And so it could have been a physical event and it also could have been a high stressful event because when you're under stress, you tuck your pelvic floor muscles under and you, you live with tension. That's a fight or flight response. But anyway, we go from latent to active and all of a sudden your trigger points are screaming. So what happens next? Well, your, your, your pelvis is trying to tell your brain, help, help, help. It hurts. So the nerves in your pelvis are sending pain neurotransmitters to your spinal cord. Help, help, help. It hurts bad. Help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Those nerves are firing constantly and they're flooding your spinal cord with neurotransmitters. So that would, that will trigger uh, a message up to your brain, but there's a hell of a lot of neurotransmitters now in your spinal cord where all those nerves merge together. What happens then? Now, this is the, the really kind of interesting part of the human body is that, you know, a lot of nerves are proximal to each other, the spinal cord. So around L5, for example, where your bladder nerves come in, well, so do your vulva nerves come in. So does some of your muscle nerves come in. Somebody's, I mean, you know, the, it's a small confined space. The nerves are close together. So here we have these muscles and the nerves by the muscles sending messages, help, help, help. Help. They fled the spinal cord. Help, help, help. But guess what? There are other nerves in the spinal cord right there and they get involved. We get an overflow. The neurotransmitters from the tight, painful muscles will then overflow to the bladder due to proximity and the vulva too because they merge together at the spinal cord. So you got pain going up to the spinal cord. And guess what? Now we've got nerve damage going down, right back to the bladder and right back to the vulva. Okay, what happens next? Then, and we call this neural crosstalk, the nerves in the bladder wall get sensitive. And we knew that 15 years ago, we had, it's called the pepperoni pizza algorithm. We knew that if the bowel was irritated, the bladder would show signs of irritation. If the bladder was injured, the bowel would show signs of irritation, throw in the vulva and you get the same thing. So if one part of the pelvis is sensitive, other parts of the pelvis are also probably going to become sensitive. So we get neurosensitization of the bladder wall. The nerves are starting to malfunction in the bladder wall. Again, because of the nerves malfunctioning from the muscles area. Then what happens? The nerves in the bladder wall release something called sepsis P. Sepsis P is very damaging to tissue. It's very, very damaging to tissue. And so sepsis P starts creating an erosion of the tissue of the bladder wall. And then because urine is getting where it's not supposed to go and, and, and the sepsis P itself is very irritating, it causes mast cells to release histamine. And histamine is what causes swelling and pain and discomfort. When you get a mosquito bite, that itching and swelling is from, from histamine being released by mast cells. So, so what's happening is you're getting, you get stuck in this loop. Irritated nerves release substance P, substance P then triggers the mast cells to release histamine. Then the histamine triggers the nerves to release more substance P and bam, you're stuck in this really vicious neuro, uh, neural, neural irritation in the bladder wall that's causing the tissue of the bladder wall to break down. Okay. And in the end, bam, the bladder wall starts to break down because your muscles are not normal because your muscles are malfunctioning. So it's kind of, okay, so to summarize, you've sustained muscle injuries, they created trigger points. 
the trigger point started damaging muscles and blood vessels. Eventually something happened which turned those trigger points on and you all of a sudden have pain, 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 pain. Those pain messages flood your spinal cord seeking help from your brain. But because of the proximity of the nerves of the bladder and the vulva and other structures down there, the bladder nerves start to become dysfunctional. The vulvar nerves start to become dysfunctional. The rectal nerves start to become dysfunctional. And then we start seeing neurosensitization of the bladder wall. And then because of that neurosensitization, we start seeing a physical breakdown of the bladder wall. All from tight muscles. And so, hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. So, it's making us, re uh, it, you know, it's interesting. So, like, here's a picture of IC subtype 2 bladder wall driven. Okay, these are not Hunter's lesions. This is what we call petechial hemorrhaging, right? Or glomerulations. And when you look at this, you're like going, okay, clearly something from outside is irritating the bladder. You know, clearly, you know, and, and this is what we were thinking 25 years ago, that there has to be something going through that person's body that is directly irritating the bladder wall. And what Dr. Weiss is saying is, uh, yeah, that's possible, but it's also quite possible that this is the result of muscle dysfunction. Fascinating, right? Fascinating. So the question then is, what's the right treatment? What's the right treatment? Now listen, if you're food sensitive, your, your bladder's messed up. And you shouldn't be doing things that are acidic. You know, you got to If your bladder is responding to food in a negative way, that tells us directly that your bladder wall is compromised for one reason or another. And number one, it could be estrogen atrophy. That's one variant. But it also could be the last stage of this muscle nerve irritation thing. So what are you going to do about it? Well, you're going to protect your bladder, right? I mean, you got to follow the bladder protocol. You have to follow the bladder protocol. I mean, you got to follow the diet and it would make sense to do something that would coat and protect your bladder so that these wounds aren't being irritated, right? But the missing link here is understanding why this happens. And for a lot of you, this is probably happening because of muscle damage, muscle damage. And again, that's what I see in 2020. I want every single one of you. Now, listen, they're not paying me for this. I have read this book twice so far. It is stunningly good and stunningly insightful. And the case studies and patient stories that he presents in here are spectacularly good. I think every single one of you need to read this book twice like I have. And I think it's really going to turn on, on your head. It's going to turn you on your head with respect to how you're considering your pelvic pain and discomfort. Kay says, do you sell that book on your website? We will be selling it. As soon as we get it, we will put it up. It's on Amazon right now for $35. We're going to sell it for $29 or $30. Um, and so um, I, hopefully I will have it on, on, well, Monday's a holiday, Tuesday or Wednesday, and I will get it up, okay? I'm going to do, again, an interview. I'm working on questions, uh, a, a, a really kind of really thorough line of questions for Dr. Weiss to try to pull this together. Debbie says, this information provides an aha moment. Jill, thanks so much for summarizing this so well. You know, I, I mean, it's just, Kay says she'd rather buy from a thank you because that's what helps me do these. So thank you when you buy stuff from the IC Network. It's very, very much appreciated. Um, I am, uh, again, two people at the end of this meeting are going to get this book for free. 
my gift to you, my gift to you. I paid full price for this, $35. I'm going to send, I've got them on my shelf right there. Look, you can see them over on my shelf. I got eight copies left. They're all going to be giveaways. And some of them are going to go to various doctors too. Uh, so at the, if you stick around, one of you are going to get, two of you are going to get this one on Facebook, one on YouTube. Okay. And I'm more than happy to do it. So consider the mind blown, like seriously, the missing link in my opinion is the fact that, okay, why doesn't a bladder treatment by itself work? Because it doesn't address the muscle issue. And until we address the and have a really proper diagnostic workup of muscle and ligaments in the pelvis. Um, it's gonna condemn patients to, you know, be taking bladder medicine their whole life um, because we're never addressing the, the ultimate reason why the nerves in the bladder and the bladder wall is so fucked up, excuse me for swearing, but it is. It just is. Um, I shouldn't have said the F-bomb, but I'm sorry. I just do every now and then. So the next thing that we have to ponder in patients, you know, and again, for those of you who have done pelvic floor physical therapy, myself included, I've done three full courses of treatment. Why does it come back? Like, what the hell? Why are my muscles tight again? Come on, I did all the work. Why six months later am I having a freaking flare? Why am I having a flare? And when they go in, they look at the bladder. And you know, a lot of you, your bladder is healthy. You don't have a bit infection in your urine at all. And they look at your bladder, they do a cystoscope, they say, hey, there's nothing wrong. I don't see anything wrong. What the hell is this flare? Why do they keep coming back over and over and over and over and over and over again? And again, Dr. Weiss points to the muscle. And, you know, I always say to patients, you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. We've got to figure out, you know, when you go to a doctor, I don't want you to go to a doctor and walk in and say, I've got, I've got IC. That's a huge mistake. You need to walk into a doctor's office and say, here are my symptoms. Can you help me understand what structures in my pelvis could be causing the symptoms? And that's one of the things he talks about is he talks about getting a thorough, proper assessment of the anatomy of the pelvis. And if you say, I see, you're not going to get that. You're going to immediately jump to bladder discussions. And that's a mistake. We need a good, thorough look at muscles too. So... You go to the doctor, the doctor goes, yeah, man, you got really, really tight muscles. We'll send you to pelvic floor physical therapy. You do pelvic floor physical therapy. You go the first time. It hurts. Holy crap. I don't want to do that again. It hurts. It hurts bad. No, I'm not, I'm not going back to that. No, are you crazy if you think I'm going to do that again? Well, you're not understanding. Is it if they can touch a muscle? and trigger your pain, that is a spectacular success. Hallelujah, baby, they found it. They touched it. They touched the organ. They, I mean, they touched the struggle, which triggered your pain. If you go to pelvic floor physical therapy and you have your pelvic floor assessment, their job is to touch muscles the first time you go. So remember, they're gonna touch low muscles, medium muscles, and deep muscles. And, and they're going to do it vaginally. They're going to go in vaginally or rectally. So if they stick their finger in and they're very gently touching muscles, and if they touch a muscle and you go, ow, spectacular. That is a great success. And now the question is, is what were you just touching? What were you just touching? What muscle was that? Right? So now that you understand that pain at that first appointment is a critical and important and successful piece of information, when you go back to pelvic floor physical therapy, their job now is to take a step back and go slowly to try to rehabilitate that muscle. They're going to address trigger points they find. They're going to try to strengthen muscles that are weak, and they're just going to try to maintain, you know, improve your muscle health. And you do it. And you respond beautifully. 
And then six months later, guess what? Damn it. It's back. Yeah, thank you, Dawn. Give me a moment and I will get back to that. It's back. You go back to the doctor and the doctor goes, gee, I don't know. I mean, your bladder looks good. But then you go, hmm, you know what? Hmm. I this pulling sensation. It's pushing sensation. And you get your tush back to the physical therapist. And the physical therapist goes, holy hell, your muscles are really tight. What happened? And you go, I don't know. I don't know what happened. And you have to repeat your pelvic floor physical therapy again. Because your muscles are tight. And as long as your muscles are tight, your bladder is not going to be healthy and your vulva is not going to be healthy. So anytime we see long-term chronic muscle dysfunction, what are we going to do? We have to look at bony structures. Because sometimes there's a reason. Do you have SI dysfunction like I do? My problem is now entirely on the left side of my pelvis. And it's related to my piriformis muscles and my SI joint and my ligaments there. That is a critical part for me. All my chemical injury, that's all healed. That's all healed. My issue now is really a muscle, a muscle bony structure issue. And again, he explores the reason for long-term chronic muscle tension in this book. And he talks about the legs. That if anything happens to your legs, that anything you sustain an injury to your legs, your pelvis is going to feel it because you got muscles to go from your legs right up deep into your pelvis. If you have one leg longer than the other, you break a leg, you break a foot, and it, after healing, your leg, one leg is shorter than the other, that's going to create long-term chronic imbalance in your pelvis. You're going to have one group of muscles on the, on the uh, shorter side stretching longer than the muscles on the far side. So... You're going to find that discussion in this book fascinating because we have to look at your legs. And, um, and then the last piece of this puzzle, let's see, he talks about how a rear end collision is going to affect the pelvic floor. Um, I mean, it's just absolutely fascinating. The last piece of this puzzle is, in fact, your feet. Because if you're walking abnormally, you are also going to directly be messing with your pelvis. And so let's look at this picture for a moment. The, the, the leg on this side is a completely normal leg, completely normal foot, positioned properly. Some of you walk with your ankle inwards. And I want you to look. Let's look at this reflected up. See, look at this. The femur goes slightly more to the outside. And the piriformis muscle right there gets stretched and gets weakened. It gets weakened. So what the last piece of his puzzle was a discovery that foot dysfunction, foot disorders uh, can also trigger muscle dysfunction, chronic pelvic pain, and bladder dysfunction. And for those patients in his, in his practice, who were coming back over and over and over with tight muscles three months later, six months later, once they finally made the foot connection and they started looking at their feet, 90% of his patients with chronic pelvic pain, I see, had foot issues. Mind-blowing and yet so real. So I'll go back to my case real quick. So y'all know that when I was 32, I was in a terrible swimming pool accident. There's no doubt about that. Okay. But when I was 13 years old, I had frequency urgency. I couldn't sit through class. I couldn't sit through class. Teachers, I was driving the teachers crazy, got called to the office, called to the nurse, sent to the doctor. What the hell is wrong with Jill? Why can't she sit through class? It didn't hurt. I just had frequency urgency. Sent to a urologist. Uh, and in, as part of their testing, they do an x-ray. I'm in the room. They let me watch the x-rays be developed. What did they find? Scoliosis. I was one who said, look at that. My back is curved. I must not have been standing up straight. Let's do it again. I'm going to stand up as straight as I can. And I, my little 13-year-old self, marched back into the x-ray, stood next to the wall where they took the picture, stood up as strong as I could, say, take it now. I'm standing up as strong as I can. Take the picture, develop it. Damn it. Scoliosis. 
isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that I developed frequency urgency at the exact same time I developed scoliosis? Because I, de I was free of scoliosis four months earlier because they did a test. Happened in four months. I got an S curve. I had a big growth spurt and it turned into a curve in my spine. And what did they do? I had 100 urethral dilations over three years. Trauma, 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 trauma. Massive antibiotics, everything, everything. Then I got vulvodynia in high school. Then I got IBS when I was in my 20s. And you know what? It breaks my heart for that little girl that they put me through all of those tests, all of those painful procedures, years of not being normal, years of not being, I remember being so embarrassed. I had a school trip and a field trip and my mother had to talk to the teacher about letting me use the bathroom. It haunted me. And then it kind of calmed down, but then the vulvodynia started and that haunted me. Guess what? Same mechanism of action. Today, 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 we ask the question, instead of just saying, hey man, it's your bladder. Now using subtyping, we're going, all right, let's look at the pelvis. Is there anything else weird going on in a pelvis? Muscle, 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 muscle. And that is a tremendous gift. I grieve for the girl that I was and how my life was changed by all of that, the suffering that happened. Um, uh, but in the end, it is 2020 and we have made tremendous strides forward and you need to carry hope in your heart. The human body is wired to heal itself. You are an anatomical mystery to be solved. It is your job to be as clear as you can possibly be with your doctors so that they can do a proper diagnostic workup. I was working with a patient on Thursday or Friday and I really, I, I got very, very frustrated with her. Uh, and if you're in here and you recognize this, I apologize, but you know why I was frustrated. Because she kept saying, I'm in pain. And I said, that's not good enough. You need to be descriptive. Where is the pain? Well, it's just, I'm in pain. No, where is the pain? Is it on the left side? Is it on the right side? Is it low? Is it high? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Does it cause any weird symptoms? Do you have a fluttering feeling, a vibration, anything weird? And she just never thought about it. She kept saying I was in, she was in pain and needed pain meds. It's like it's not good enough, hun. And her her homework for this for for this weekend before she went to the doctor early this week was to actually do a pain diary and to try to be able to discuss her pain in depth so that she could communicate that with her doctor to give him clues so that he would know what type of diagnostic workup to do because her symptoms also appear to be extremely muscle driven. So again, it's just incredible. And now let me just shut up for a moment. Let me take a drink, you guys. Woo! Hey man, can I talk? <laughs> I'm excited. Like literally in 20 plus years doing the IC network, I have never been excited as I am right now. I am so excited because I really think we have found one of the big missing pieces here. So. Now listen, there are subtypes. Not everybody's the same. Not all of you have muscle injury, but a lot of you do. But some of you, you know, might have, have chemocystitis from chemotherapy, and that's okay. We know for chemocystitis, we're going to calm and soothe the bladder. Some of you might have um, um, estrogen atrophy and not have a muscle issue at all, and that's okay. That's okay. Um, I'm not painting broad strokes here, but it is helping us understand that group of patients who never responded to bladder therapy. Okay. So now I have a product reveal. Hold on a sec. Let's see here. Oh, I didn't turn on my Valentine's thing. Hold on. I have my little, my little love sign. Not that you would see it. See? Okay. So, um, where'd it go? Come on. I just picked it up. 
Oh, here it is. Okay. <laughs> um, um, um. So one of the other really good things that is happening right now is um, um, we have a new company called Natural Approach Nutrition that is actually started by an IC patient that I worked with, um, but he actually didn't have IC. What he had was a, medic, a surgical malpractice. Uh, the doctor, uh, a, he came in with symptoms of frequency urgency. A doctor did surgery, ended up making a colossal mistake in the surgery. It turned out that doctor had made a lot of mistakes in a lot of patients and is now in jail. But this man has now undergone 13 surgeries to try to repair the damage done by the first surgery. And it's just been hell for him. I got this email from a man in distress, you know, about five years ago, and it just touched me. And I wrote this really long email back, didn't know who he was. And, um, and just offered whatever help I could, you know, and he uh, today says, you have no idea you saved my life that day. If you hadn't sent me that email, I don't know where I would be. So I helped him for a couple of years. And then finally, one day he goes, you know, Jill, I kind of need to tell you who I am. And I was like, you don't have to tell me who you are. I've worked with federal judges. I've worked with actors, Broadway stars. I don't need to know who you are. And he goes, no, I need to tell you who you are because I want to help you now. And it turned out he was the CEO of a whole bunch of companies, <laughs> including protein shakes and things like that. And he goes, I had no idea people suffered as badly as they do with pelvic pain and I want to help. And he created a company. He gave his other companies to other people in his business. And he started Natural Approach Nutrition, specifically to help people who were suffering. And he's the guy who led the team that put together Bladder Builder last year. And this was a result of him and I working together with Dr. Ken Peters and a couple of other urologists. So we came up with this kind of next generation supplement called Bladder Builder. And then when uh, Sister Protec went off market for a while, we did bladder rest. And then when we had the PEA IC research study, which showed that palmitoethanolamide was remarkably successful at reducing pain, at neuropathic pain, specifically pain of IC, he put together Peora. A lot of patients are using this now very, very successfully to help reduce their pain. This is awesome. But he was asked by... Um, uh, a major university to try to come up with a new supplement that would help prevent infections. And it's awesome. And here's one of the very first bottles. It's called Prevent. And this is for uh, people who are struggling with recurring infections. And so we are going to have this sooner rather than later, uh, probably in the next month. And it's super, super exciting. This is probably going to be one of the most successful products in this product line. Uh, there's more. I can't say more yet, but I was allowed to reveal this today. And uh, so you'll be able to get this on the IC network fairly soon if you feel that you're struggling with recurring infections. So that's the exciting reveal for today. All right. All right. Enough of me going off and talking about stuff. Hey, man, let's take your questions. Let's take your questions. I love these support group meetings because while I'm talking, y'all are supporting each other so well. Right now on Facebook, we have over 220 comments on YouTube here. Not quite as many because we don't have as many people on YouTube, but still y'all are so good at supporting each other. I love you so much. Debbie says, this information provides an aha moment. Jill, thanks so much for summarizing this so well. Uh, Patty says, oh my God, oh good, I'm an infection person in part anyway. So again, the prevent is going to, prevent is a, is, is like Allura. Um, it's, it's, it's very similar to Allura, but much, much, much less expensive. I can only say so much. Um, Len says, how long have we been live for? We have been live for one hour and 20 minutes. Susan says, can a tailbone injury 40 years ago affect the pelvis? Yes, absolutely. Because the odds are from that tailbone injury, you either could have a bone that didn't fuse together correctly, which would really, which would result in a, an improper curve of that bone, which would then stress the muscles, um, and or you could have residual trigger points that have never resolved in that area. 
All right, let me go back up to Facebook here. All right, Facebook, you know what? I got to move my screen here to try to open this up. So if I'm looking down, it's just because I had to open my screen. Linda says, I started out with fibromyalgia before I see hit. All right, so, so Linda, he talks about that in this book because they do believe that some patients with fibromyalgia actually have a myofascial pain syndrome that the, so the fascia in the human body is kind of like um like did you ever if you ever bought a chicken breast in the store and you know that that chicken breast has a very th very thin whitish coating around it that's fascia and then you end up kind of cutting the fascia to get to the meat below and the fascia in the human body is basically one intact piece that starts from the feet goes all the way up to your brain and if the fascia in the feet are dysfunctional, that can affect the fascia throughout the rest of the body and creates the foundation for what they also believe could be a myofascial pain syndrome like fibromyalgia. And you guys on Facebook, I can't scroll back very far. So Carrie says both antibiotics have been linked to studies to fluoroquinolone antibiotics like Cipro. So we know guys, fluoroquinolone antibiotics, Cipro, Levo Levoquin should never be used now for bladder infections unless something else is going on, unless nothing else will work because they have, they're, they're considered uh, far too dangerous now. The, the risks outweigh the benefits of any Cipro or any Levoquin prescription. Carrie says, really important to regulate the nervous system. See Irene Lyons' explanation of polyvagal therapy. Yeah, you're right. Jessica says, can severe constipation other than a fall or damage cause muscle damage? Well, severe constipation is often the reason. Severe constipation can be the result of very, very tight muscles or a malfunctioning nerve and or just an improper diet, nodding and nodding enough, enough fiber. What, what, one of the signs of chronically tight muscles is, in fact, constipation. Kathy says she loves the bladder builder. Awesome. Jennifer says, how do I recover the muscles? So in the book, he talks about that. So ultimately, in the end, you have to work with a physical therapist because they need to try to find the trigger points and address the trigger points. And it's hard. I mean, I know, like I'm going through this right now um, because I'm reading this book and I'm just going, I'm trying to apply it to my own situation going, okay, I know I have trigger points in my piriformis muscle. I know I have trigger points in my levator at times. Um, but the pelvic floor physical therapist never worked on the piriformis as it goes outside of the pelvis area. And I think I have trigger points there. And so I emailed my physical medicine doctor and I'm going to try to go in and have an evaluation to see if they can find any other issues. But I think in the end, I think that my left side pelvic pain is SI dysfunction uh, from scoliosis and long-term muscle strain um, th that has weakened ligaments. And I think I'm going to end up being a prolotherapy patient where they try to get that ligament to uh, tighten again. And I sent them an email about it last week. I said, you know, do you do prolotherapy? Can we work on this ligament? And he said, yes, we do. But I need to warn you, it's going to be very bloody and very painful. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for something very bloody and very painful. But anyway, you know what? Ultimately, in the end, we have to just try to correct the muscle and bony abnormalities, if at all possible. And if we can't fix the bony abnormalities, then we got to work and work on those muscles. Jessica says, ha ha, Jill and the F-bomb. Girl, I didn't swear three years ago. Y'all know why. What happened three years ago? Carrie says, I believe it's a pattern of holding stress. It is. You know, Carrie, it can be for some patients. And again, this is something that he addressed really, really well in the book. You know, you have to think about it. Again, the pelvis is the buffer for the human body. It supports the weight from above and it redirects the, the, uh, the uh, forces uh, from the legs up when we're walking, right? But the pelvis also is the center of our fight or flight response. The nerves in the pelvis go to a more primitive part 
of our brain. And um, he compares it to the anatomy of a dog. So think about it this way. A happy dog is wagging his tail. He is walking, you know, he's walking, his tail is wagging. Life is good for that dog. And then something happens and that dog gets scared. What does that dog? That dog tucks under, the tail goes between the legs and the hips are rotated down. It's a, it's a rotating downward. And, you know, you try walking with your tail down, that's not normal. You can see the dog, their posture drops, their hips drop. And, and that's absolute muscle dysfunction. And he very, very successfully makes the case that if you are under long-term chronic stress, your tail is stuck between your legs. We have tails, guys. We had a normal tail like a dog until we were six weeks old when that tail got reabsorbed. But some children, it doesn't get reabsorbed and they're really born with tails. But y'all have a tail bone. We have tails. We have the exact same musculature in, that performs the exact same functions that a dog does. And so when we're happy, our pelvis is open, things are happy, blood is flowing beautifully. When we're stressed, things are tucked under. And he makes the point of talking about ballet and how harmful ballet can be to the pelvis over the long term because a ballerina, I mean, I took ballet for, I don't know, about a year or two. I never got on point. I tried, I couldn't do it. But, you know, when you're, when you're doing ballet, you're taught to tuck under, right? You know, and so when you walk, you walk tucked. I mean, that's just ballet. You know, you're just, you know, this is normal. This is normal. This is tucked. We would call that a pelvic tilt. And I still remember, I still remember Dr. Marshall Stoller, UC San Francisco, sharing that he, one of his most uh, challenging patients was a ballerina, uh, was an active ballerina. Um, and so a history of dance, a history of tucking that pelvic floor under, or if you wear high heels, super, super, super high heels. I was watching um, on my feed, um, a, 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 a very quick fashion show because it was, it was kind of, who is it? It was the blondes and Disney villains. Uh, I don't know. It just came across my feed this morning. And I was like, I watched it. And they had the models wearing eight inch, 10 inch heels. I mean, they're walking on their toes. And so again, what the heck, if I tilt up, right. And I'm not even wearing heels. I'm just on my toes. What, do, what does that do? to these muscles here and the spine here. And so high, wearing high heels is, is, is challenging to the pelvis if you wear them for long periods of time. And it just infuriates me. I mean, I guess as a woman, you know, what is the purpose? You, you gotta remember most shoes are designed by men. Why? You know, because they want you to look sexy and they don't care about the damage it's doing to your body. And, and that just pisses me off. I do not need to present my butt in high heels for a man to admire. I'm sorry. I'm a mature older woman. I got nothing, nothing to prove. I'm going to wear, <laughs> hey man, this is what I wear every day. I'm long past my high heel days. You couldn't pay me to wear high heels anymore. Okay. And then he also talks about abuse and he even talks about potty training. You know, he, he shares a, a story. Oh, actually, it was a kind of a, a really sad story, but very similar to other stories I've heard from patients over the years. Uh, uh, one um, older man had constant chronic uh, issues that they thought were prostatitis and other things. And when he did the muscle evaluation, he found massive muscle dysfunction. And it turned out when this man was a child, if he did not have a bowel movement before he went to school, his mother forced an enema every single school day. And the damage that did to that young child. And so he got to the point where obviously he dreaded it. It hurt. His muscles got tight. That little boy had his tail tucked between his legs and his pelvis down. And now 50, 55 years later, the damage is profound. But once they address the muscles and got the muscles functioning healthy and any other issues, that man did substantially better. And that is a story he shares in this book. Nicole says, so Carrie, I agree with you. 
it can be a pattern of holding stress. It's just understanding where you hold the stress. You hold the stress in your pelvis. Okay. Nicole says, we just walking only help help damage muscles. I have been walking regularly for the last three months and I've been starting to feel a bit better. I started with 3000 steps a day. You slowly increase it by 500 and I never miss a day. Girl, you are way better than me. I need to be doing that. Um, uh, you know, you, uh, what I always say to people is you can't run a marathon on a broken leg. Don't try to run a marathon on a broken pelvis or a broken bladder. Nicole, I think it's really, really, really important that we understand what's going on with your pelvis first, because if you've got one leg longer than the other um, and you're walking long distances, you're actually reinforcing muscle tension, you know, and I'm not saying don't walk. I'm going to be walking after I do this, uh, do this meeting. Um, but it's you can't you can't fake it here. And that's kind of what he's saying here is, is let's not make any guesses anymore. Now we have better clues. And so it would be very interesting, Nicole, for you to go to a physical therapist, have them measure your legs. See if you got one leg longer than the other. If you do, then you want to work with a podiatrist to give you a little lift inside one of your shoes so that at least when you're walking, your hips are level rather than one being off like that. Gary said, pain clinic told me to keep moving. I agree. I agree. Your muscles get weak when you stop moving. You just, it's about intensity here, guys. You can, you know... You wouldn't try to run a marathon on a broken leg. Don't try to run a marathon on a broken bladder. You're still trying to figure stuff out. Nobody's telling you to go walk five miles right now. What we're saying is, okay, keep active. Try to keep moving. Try not, you know, if sitting hurts, stand up. Try to find the position that's comfortable. But ultimately, in the end, we got to figure out what's going on that's giving you the stress and discomfort. Rhonda says, I did some of the pelvic floor physical therapy, but couldn't afford to keep going. My muscles were very tight, so it makes sense. It did hurt, but you couldn't afford it. You did six treatments, but you did not notice any changes in your pain issues. Well, well, hun, you know, I mean, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. Your muscles were very tight. That's not healthy, period. And there's got to be a reason why your muscles were tight that six treatments didn't do. Six treatments wouldn't address. Physical therapy works on muscle health, but why are your muscles tight in the first place? Is there something going on that could be creating that long-term chronic muscle tension? And Rhonda, I bet there is. Carrie says, I'm going to try snorkeling with flippers next. Interesting. Yeah, he, another thing he talks a lot about in the book are the nerve injuries that happens when muscles are injured. And he does say, we all have always said that swimming was safe. But if you have a nerve injury, he says, when you swim, you know, to use your arms and not your legs, um, which is interesting. Linda says, I have a shorter leg. Yeah. Jessica is saying that um, she went on the IC diet in September 2017 uh, with a John Hopkins version that also has no dairy and that her pelvic floor physical therapist told her no soy or gluten. And once you did the IC diet with that, all of your fibro and chronic fatigue symptoms went away. I believe it. I was stunned. Yeah. I believe it, my friend. I believe it. Mm. Now, if you try to go off the diet, it all comes back. I'm in a bladder flare right now from eating too many various fruits. Well, you know, again, subtyping. Again, subtyping. Not everybody's the same. You have, I do better without gluten. I do. And I don't eat any soy at all. Uh, and I, and I don't drink, I don't drink milk. I swap coconut milk instead. It's really rare that I do any dairy. Uh, I haven't done dairy in 25 years. I know that when I do dairy, I get very crampy, um, uh, and mucusy. Um, so I, I mean, you know, you got to understand that a lot of the foods that we're eating today are crazy, unhealthy foods. And, Adults were never meant to be eating dairy and soy. There's so much soy in our diet and there's so many concerns about soy. I mean, you go back a hundred years, people weren't eating soy to the degree that we are today. 
Um, soy is an estrogen mimicker. Uh, gluten, again, is, is certainly challenging for people with celiac. And uh, there's a lot of carbs in our diet that we you know, have issues with. And yet I was working with a patient yesterday. Interestingly, she had an outstandingly good diet, uh, extremely good diet. And then she had, she developed gout. And she developed gout because her family were hunters and she thought it would be really healthy if she ate a venison liver. And she ended up eating two or three venison livers and it gave her gout because organ meats are high and whatever it is that triggers gout. So everybody has their own unique preferences and it's your job to find what will help your body thrive. I know in my case, I, I do not do soy. I do, I try to keep gluten fairly low in my life. I don't eat, I try not to eat regular pasta. I do quinoa pasta. I don't do dairy, although I do eat cheese every now and then. And I'm okay with cheese. I just don't drink milk or anything like that. Angie says, please explain that you have to keep doing your physical therapy at home. I have to do it every day. I've exercised. Yeah, you know what? Angie makes a really, really important point here. And that is that, listen, kind of the least important part of physical therapy is actually seeing the physical therapist, which you know is really important. But it's what you do when you get home that's critical here. Because y'all just can't go to the physical therapist and have her work, have her work on you 30 minutes every week. That's not going to fix the problem. You've got muscles that are super, super tight and it's going to take work. You might have to do internal massage. They're going to give you stretches and exercises. They might give you a, th a glass wand. I have a sample here. So these are the ones that we suggest. They're, they're uh, made by a company called IC Relief. This is the Easy Magic glass wand. Uh, you want glass rather than plastic because some of the plastics can leave plastic fibers where you don't need them. So this is an example. This is my demo of, of this glass wand that you can insert vaginally or rectally. And their goal here, I mean, this is not quite the right representation, but let's just think of a, think of a, your muscle as being kind of like this, or just pretend there's fibers above that. What they're going to do with the last one vaginally is they're just going to, or their finger, their finger, they're going to just slowly try to get these muscles um, long and loose again. But when you're home, you, you know, how do you do it? You can't get your finger up there, especially if you've got a trigger point. And so what you do is you, you, you use the last wand. And, and, and I'm telling you, it's weird. Getting used to it's hard. I only started using this after my hysterectomy and holy hell, my surgical scars were extremely sensitive and I just shook like a, uh, shook like, I don't know what, I just, it was hard to work on that area that had been surgically traumatized. But in the end, anytime now I feel anything weird happening, any vibration, especially in the morning, if I'm sleeping, if I sleep the wrong way, uh, I, I will end up, doing something weird to my SI joint and the muscles there and then things start to vibrate and I'm dealing with this quivering sensation on my left side. Rocky says, is this recorded? The answer is yes. It will be saved on Facebook and YouTube. Kathy says, I have scoliosis too. I have IBS and Crohn's too. Yeah. Yep. I've always said, if there's one thing I could change about my life, it would just be to repair the scoliosis. And it's better. It's way better than it was. Jessica says, Jill, I'm wondering if I, if plugged arteries from coronary artery, artery disease can cause a problem with lack of blood flow to the bladder too. All the ladies in my family are 20 to 30 years older than me and almost all are hundred percent plugged. Heart disease runs strong in my family, but the plugging likely doesn't come from overnight. I don't know, hun. I, I mean, your argument makes sense to me. I, I just don't know. I mean, we know with radiation cystitis, patients who have radiation therapy for prostatitis or something like that, we know that that damages blood, blood vessels that would then trigger this, all the symptoms that we associate with. That'd be a really, really good question for your heart doctor and for, yeah. 
but I, th I think you're you're possibly right. Hi, Molly. Susan says, I have one leg shorter on the right side. Also, my right pelvis is turned outward. Definitely caused my bladder spasms and pain. Exactly. Exactly. So the question now is what you're doing about it. You got to lift a new shoe. Angela says, I went vegan three years ago, but I haven't tried gluten or soy. Still have to watch out with acidic foods, but dairy products cause me so many flare ups. Yeah, I got to tell you, you know, my mom turned 91 years old yesterday. So we had her a very mellow 91th birthday for her yesterday. Um, and I do all the food now. And so anytime my parents have any issues with food, my dad now, oh, he can't do any citrus. He can't do any tomato. He's 97. Uh, we have to be so careful with acids. He can't do any of his coffee or anything like that because he's got a 97 year old bladder. My mom, uh, after she gets her hair done, uh, I used to get her a frozen yogurt. And the last time I got her a frozen yogurt, I put a carob on peanuts on it because she loves that combination. She got so sick. So, oh my God. So sick. This was like 10 days ago. It's like, all right, that's off the table. And again, I think it was a combination. It's just too rich for her. Even though she's done it for years, it just, she hit that point where it's just too rich for her. Molly says, sup, Jill. Sup, everybody. <laughs> uh, Paige is asking about microgen. So again, getting, getting back to our subtypes for a moment. So I see subtype 100 lesions. I see subtype 2 bladder wall driven. So we know for patients who have a direct bladder injury or bladder driven symptoms, we do have to do a proper workup for that. So they're going to rule, they're going to test for infection. Uh, and um, here's what we've learned. What we have learned in the last two years is that a typical urinalysis is simply not effective and is incapable of assessing your urinary biome. And so for patients with complex recurring infections, they will move to next generation urine testing. In fact, they're doing next generation urine testing for the coronavirus, guys. Um, that next generation testing is just critically important. Hold on, uh, is that it right here? Here it is. There it is. So if you do think that you're struggling with infection, and, and listen, let's be honest, we all did. <laughs> we all do. I can't tell you the number of, of, uh, of your analysis that I've had. And in, in, in let's see, I'm going to say my entire life, and I don't want to say how old I am, except I'm obviously menopausal. I have only had three infections, two in 25 years, 27 years, two. Um, and, but, you know, you having a flare, you're going, it's got to be infection. You, some of you are self-medicating with antibiotics. Some of you might even feel better on antibiotics, not understanding that antibiotics have an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, but that said, if you really want to know what the hell's going on with your flora down there, you can get a next generation urine test. Go to bladderhealth.org. It's a website I built two years ago. And it will, it, there's a bunch of videos of doctors who use it. This is what the elite doctors are doing. This is what the infectious disease doctors are doing is to really try to understand why you are struggling with recurring symptoms. Uh, our local doctors don't know anything about it. Local doctors, so they think it's hooey. But all you got to do is look at a coronavirus story and you see that they're using next generation, they use next generation testing and they are using next generation testing to see if somebody has a coronavirus. It's that good and that detailed. And the important part of next generation urine testing is not only will it identify the good bacteria and the bad bacteria that could be there, it will also identify bacterial resistance genes. And that's important uh, because it'll tell you what antibiotics are going to work and what antibiotics might not work.
Char Charlie says, I have a painful foo-foo. I have no idea what a foo-foo is, Charlie. Sorry. What is it? What's a foo-foo? Kim says, what about chiropractic treatments? You know, I tell a story. In, I told a story in our magazine uh, last year about a woman who, you know, she'd been diagnosed with IC. Um, none of the bladder treatments worked. It had been, you know, five or six years of pretty intense suffering. She saw, she read something on our website about pudendal neuralgia uh, or watched one of these videos. I don't know. Um, and she thought she had pudendal neuralgia. She went to the doctor. The doctor said, yeah, you have pudendal neuralgia, but the doctor was like, we don't know why, except your sacrum, your tailbone is at a weird angle. And she's like, okay, what do we do about it? And he's like, I don't know. So she went to a chiropractor and the chiropractor over a period of many, many treatments was able to get her tailbone slash sacrum at the correct angle and that completely resolved her problem but once uh, uh whenever she feels it going out of position she goes back to the chiropractor and yet i have to tell you i've also i'm also currently working with a patient who is badly damaged and has severe nerve damage from a chiropractic treatment the the drop table treatment so i think you've got to be really careful with with chiropractic therapy. Um, I've had it a couple of times. I laughed my way through it. I was so stunned when I'm stressed, I laugh. And those big bangs, you know, on your body were like, what the hell? <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I would be cautious. I would tell them that you've got muscle issues, you have nerve issues and whatever they're going to do, they need to be very gentle. We don't need them to harm and damage your bladder. Kathy says, can you take Peora and Bladder Builder together? Yeah. You, you don't need to take as much Peora because Bladder Builder also has PEA in it, but they're all meant, you know, they're, they're meant to work synergistically together. The point of Bladder Builder is, is really for people on a limited diet. It does a lot. It has a lot of mechanisms of action in one capsule, so you don't have to take more. I was working with another patient last week who ended up at the vitamin shop. She thought she needed a vitamin. They sold her hundreds of dollars worth of stuff. She's reading them off to me on the phone. I'm like, oh God, no, 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 no. Take him back, take him back, take him back. You know, uh, none of the things they sold were beneficial for, for interstitial cystitis at all. D says, I need a good PT referral. Does my doctor have to refer me? Uh, usually your doctors do do a referral. Doctors usually don't have any problems with it. Um, if money's an issue, if you can just go once, even if you have to pay out of pocket, going once is meaningful because they can at least then tell you what the problem might be. And that's important. Um, and then, you know, uh, they can tell you what it is. They can give you exercises. And if you can go once a quarter just for an update while you do the exercises at home, sometimes that's what you got to do when you've got a limited budget. But if it is covered by insurance, just go for it. But again, if you have long-term chronic muscle tension, always look at bony structures and ask you know, ask the doctor, I mean, ask the physical therapist why they think that might be happening. You guys, I need to take a moment and thank our sponsor. Our sponsor for this meeting is Prelief, also known as DSC Healthcare Solutions. Prelief is the longest supplement used by IC patients. It was uh, well involved, it was developed well before uh, I got involved 30 years ago uh, or 28 years ago. Uh, Prelief is an acid reducer. So if you've got to go to grandma's house and have her lasagna or she's going to yell at you and you're worried about the acid irritation, Prelief will reduce the acid in your stomach so that your stomach is not so irritated. Um, and so Prelief has been used by tens and thousands of patients over the years to help them enjoy some foods that a tender bladder or a tender stomach might have prevented them from enjoying. Of course, we always say that you don't eat pre-leaf like candy. It is a calcium supplement. The calcium has to go somewhere. And so if you're prone to calcium-based kidney stones, this is probably not going to be the right, the right therapy for you. Um, but, you know, used uh, before a meal, it is awesome. 
It's absolutely awesome. And it's been used by many, many, many people. There you go. So thank you, Khalil and DSC Healthcare Solutions for all of your support of our support group meetings. It, it, we could not be here without you. I have worked with the companies doing prelief since I started the IC network. There is no other company that has been as supportive of the IC community as um, uh, AK Pharma and then DSC Healthcare Solutions. We are very, very blessed. In fact, I love them so much. We should put this over here. Look. I actually meant to put that down. <laughs> I'm very visual. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> I love colors, so. Alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. Walgreens, ten bucks. <laughs> it's the cutest little. It's the cutest little light there. Okay. Jody says, after almost ten years, my I see my doctor told me to try acupuncture. These doctors are in the dark; they don't know what to do. Jody, I gotta tell you, he actually talks about acupuncture in this book, uh, very, very successfully and encouragingly. He got to the point where he does acupuncture. He did acupuncture on his patients. Why? Because it actually helps on um, kind of. Uh, address trigger points. Number one, an acupuncture needle into a trigger point can help. It's called dry needling, can help break up a trigger point, but it does help improve kind of kind of the ebbs and flows of biological activity in the pelvis. Oh, that's the best I can go. I can't give you the specific. I don't remember off the top of my head. But anyway, acupuncture has a place. It absolutely has a place. So I, I, I'm going to do it again because, again, I want to deal with these long-term trigger points that I have on the left side of my body. So I've already made an appointment to have it done again. I didn't like it when I first did it, but um, I'm going back. I want to just try to deal with these. Lisa says craniosacral therapies help. Yeah. Molly says, you've been in a lot of pain. Pain takes up to an hour, more or less. Girl, why? Uh, so muscle, right? Is that why you can't, your, your peeing is so long or your muscles super, super tight and it, they just won't let you release your urine? Anytime it's hard to start your urine stream, we always look to muscles or nerves. The classic sign of somebody with pelvic floor dysfunction is you can't start your pee right away. Jessica says, I forgot to tell you that I've had moralgia parastica of the left hip for the past 25 years. No doctor, neurologist, physical therapist seems to be able to help it. Neurologist says nothing can be done. I often wonder what role it has to play in my bladder symptoms. Something is pinched in there, obviously. Pelvic physical therapist can't find any sore spots inside, though. And no tenderness at all when she does the exam. So, yeah, I don't know, hon. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. I don't know. What is the name of the book? The name of the book is Breaking Through Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain. You'll be able to get it from the IC network next week, a couple of days. You can get it on Amazon right now, but we're going to have a five or six dollars less. You can get it on Kindle for nine dollars, or if you're part of the Kindle monthly subscription, it's free. Hey man, hey, you can't go wrong if it's free. The challenge with Kindle is you can't print it out. And I think it's important. You're going to need to reread sections. Like I've read it twice so far. And now that I'm writing an, art, writing an article on it for a magazine, I'm like having to read sections for a third time. And this is a pack full of info. Terry says, I'm reading Dr. Weiss's book. Definitely have the foot thing going on. Years ago, a physical therapist said maybe PNE. Have you discussed this today? Yeah, we did. We did, Terry. Carrie, shake your tail feather. Yeah. Jennifer says, do you believe in anti-inflammatory foods and supplements that can help or even heal? Yeah. I mean, I think our diets are so full of crap right now. Uh, eating foods that can be calming and soothing and more healthy is absolutely the right thing to do. I think it's important. I think... 
that reducing our dependence on sweeteners and sugar is very, very important. Sugar is a, a well known to promote inflammation, even though sugar is bladder friendly uh, as compared to uh, artificial sugar, for example, uh, NutraSweet, for example. Um, you know, having a lot of sugar going through our bodies is damaging. It raises our insulin level. It turns off our ability to metabolize fat. It does all sorts of bad things. You know, getting a diagnosis of IC is kind of like a wake up call or anytime you face any major illness, like my sister is going through some other really big stuff right now. And, and anytime you face a, a crisis like this, you, uh, it forces you to look at your conduct and behavior and what you're putting in your body. And if you've been living on junk food, it's time to get off. We got to, this is about healing. This is about health. You know, he talks in here. So now, you know, one of the big arguments now, do you want to be vegan or do you want to be protein based? And he talks about that a little bit. He mentions it in one area that that for a muscle healing, muscle healing requires the intake of proteins. You know, we are not vegans. I mean, I'm sorry, we are not. No, what's the right word? No, not vegans. We are not. Um, uh, oh, God. OK, I'm having a I'm having a brain moment right now. Uh, we are, our bodies are divine. We're not herbivores. Cows are herbivores. It is hard to process grass. That's why cows have several stomachs and that's why they chew their cud. They're chewing the grass. Our body is not designed for, as for an herbivore. We are an omnivore, which means that we have one stomach. We are, uh, we are designed to eat meat and we are designed to eat fruits and things like that. Um, some would argue that we are carnivores. I would fight that argument based upon the design of our mouth because when you look at a carnivore, they have long teeth for chewing and they have a lot of teeth for chewing. Think of an alligator, think of a saber tooth tiger or a lion. That is not the way our teeth are built. And so our body really is designed for an omnivore diet. Um, and, you know, you look at the history of carb consumption, it's really interesting because I think I was reading, a hist I was watching a nutrition documentary and they talked about how, I want to say in the Middle East or in Af Northern Africa, like thousands of years ago, they started trying to eat grasses and people got very, very sick from it. So uh, it's been an adaptation over time. And anyway, that's a whole nother story. There's some really good nutrition do documentaries out there that you should watch. Helen says, I'm just exhausted and can't get off my heat back. I see P PN and nose infection since menopause. Girl, hmm, I'm so sorry. You know, you know what menopause has done for me? Look at that. Do you see all these red spots? This, this is what happened to me after menopause, is I just got these red spots everywhere. Like, it's not so bad on that side. You see all those spots? Like, what the hell? Makes me crazy. I got them on my legs everywhere and, and nobody, you know, nobody can give me an explanation as to why. Hey man, I got no shame. I'll show you my body. You want to see my spot? There's my spots. <laughs> Jessica, let's see. I went on a gluten-free diet, icy diet. My fibro and chronic fatigue went away. That's why I have my two. Yeah. You're very welcome, Jessica. Yeah, you guys, every now and then, if you call on Saturdays, I really do pick up the phone. And then I went out and gardened for five hours. It's awesome. My one day a week to work in the garden, my butterfly garden. Brenda says, I read all the ingredients now when I go shopping. If the word soy is in the ingredients, I don't eat them at all. Norma says, anybody use paleo protein in smoothies? You know, um, I do um, egg whites, uh, just whites. Just whites is uh, powdered pasteurized egg whites, and those work really well. Let's 
Jessica says, did you, did you know if you overblend protein powders, it breaks down the protein that's no longer good? I believe that. You want to stir it into the smoothie after you're done blending. That makes sense. Good morning, Suzanne. Suzanne, are you in Australia? Or New Zealand? Jennifer says, thank you so much for all the wonderful info you talk about. I love that you get so specific with everything. Keep up your hard work. Hey, I'm not lying. I am just like, it's so hard because I'm so excited about where we are in the IC movement, you know, and it's just like, there's so much I want to do. And now we've got, you know, these happening and this happening and streams happening. And I, I wish I had a twin. I think, I, I think honestly, I'm going to have to, I, I'm good. And I meant to hire somebody last year and I didn't, um, because it's too busy with the fires, but I'm probably going to be hiring uh, two more people to help run the IC network. And again, guys, I only hire IC. I try to only hire IC or pelvic pain patients. So when that comes up, uh, anybody out there right now, if you're a writer, uh, uh, I will pay for articles um, for our magazine and stuff like that. Um, I'm looking for writers. I've got Stacy is a fabulous writer, but I need more because I don't have time to write right now. It's killing me. I love to write, but I'm, we're going to be doing lots of videos. We're going to be filming a documentary on IC this summer. I got to get my tooth fixed to do that. It's crazy. But I'm excited and I hope you're excited too. You know, oh, good things are happening right now. Oh yeah, Jessica, that's what got you. You So Jessica was the one who ate the, had the uh, gout from the deer liver. And Jessica, my, uh, one of my, our oldest friends came for dinner last night. Um, and uh, he also has gout. He had gout and he confirmed that, yeah, liver is absolutely well known for a triggering gout. So I'm glad you're better. Plus, I, I don't know how, girl, seriously, I don't know how you swallowed it because liver to me is just, oh, oh. every now and then my, my dad used to fix liver and onions and I would just gag. I just, I, I don't know. There's just something about the smell. I just couldn't tolerate. So power to you that you could get it down, but I'm sorry. I got the gout from it. Suzanne says, if we have inflammation in our bladder, so why not treat with anti-inflammatory meds? I'm bladder well driven. Well, again, Suzanne, as I argued today, went by presenting um, Dr. Weiss's argument. What he says is that, is that in some cases, neuroinflammation in the bladder, which causes a release of substance fee, which causes the bladder wall to break down, is ultimately derived by muscle tension and muscles that are screaming in pain, overwhelming your nervous system. And until we deal with the source of the problem, which is tr tight trigger points, poor circulation, unhealthy muscles, and unhealthy nerves, the anti-inflammatories really would not have a beneficial effect, a, long, a beneficial long-term effect. It might treat superficial symptoms, but it's not necessarily gonna get to the root of the problem. Uh, with the exception of perhaps Hunter's lesions, where they can inject a steroid directly into the lesion. But in all of the research that's been done with IC, the only group that consistently has inflammation in their bladder wall are Hunter's lesion patients. The rest of us usually don't have inflammation in our bladder wall to a great degree. I mean, that really overwhelming inflammation that you would see in a Hunter's lesion. Hello, Shauna. Becca says, five doctors told me I needed to seek mental help because my pain wasn't real. Well, screw them, Becca. Screw them. You know, I, 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 I mean, now listen, you got to understand. You got to understand that doctors are taught to, to diagnose by observation. And if you've got a muscle issue, a nerve issue that's deep in your pelvis, they cannot observe that. If they're, if they're skilled, they might be able to use their hands to evaluate your pelvic floor like Dr. Weiss where, so that they could see some of that dysfunction that would normally be hidden from the naked eye. 
And so that's concept number one. But concept number two, Becca, that Dr. Weiss explains beautifully is that if you struggle with long-term anxiety or stress, that is going to take a direct toll on your pelvic floor muscles because you're going to be tucking your pelvic floor muscles uh, underneath, uh, under, which is then going to create long-term pelvic floor dysfunction, which is going to lead to trigger points. And so when we look at these subtyping systems, and if you look at all the treat IC treatment plans that have been released in the last five to 10 years, they're really, they all say, as, if a patient is struggling with anxiety, we have to treat that. They're not saying, they're not saying your anxiety is causing it all. They're not saying it's all in your head. What they are saying is let's understand contributing factors. And so um, first doctor I saw, Becca, the first doctor I saw suggested I go talk to a psychiatrist too. And I did. I did. I I'll tell you, I fell out with one of my best friends uh, uh, the first year of my IC because she actually said to my face, I think you like being in pain. And I think you need mental health to figure out why you like being in pain. Gee, I dropped her in a heartbeat. I was suffering. And so, but now we know why, but unfortunately, again, medical schools taught really from about 1952 to about 1990, that interstitial cystitis was a mental and emotional disorder in many patients. And so uh, today that shouldn't be happening. And I'm sorry that that happened to you. Again, that's why I say when you go to a doctor for the first time, please don't walk in and say, you've got IC. Because that's what can happen. You can fall down that, that rabbit hole of old assumptions. You've got to walk into a doctor's office and be very clear and specific about your symptoms. Your ability to discuss them in depth is going to determine how successful you are. You cannot say, I have pain down there. That does not work. Is your pain internal? Is it external? Is it inside your body? Is it outside your body? Is it to the left? Is it to the right? Is it low? To the, is it high? Is it sharp? Does it feel electrical? Is it dull? Does it have a burning sensation? What makes it worse? What makes it better? What time of day is it worse? What time of day is it better? What do you turn to? What do you naturally turn to when you're in pain? What gives you comfort? That's all information that a doctor can use to help understand your anatomy. And I hate, you know what? Like seriously here, seriously, would y'all get a mirror and look at your bits? You, you can't just say I have pain down there on the outside and not look. You need to know what your body looks like so that if you're in pain, you can look at it and go, well, that's not normal. I, for example, am remarkably red all the time. But I know I'm red. Other doctors would go, wow, you're red. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a redhead. No, <laughs> but you know, but my skin, my mucous membranes from my lips on are really, really red. It just is what it is. It's the way I'm built. But you need to look at your body. You need to look at your rectum, your perineum, your vagina, your urethral opening, your clitoris, your vulvar lips, all of that. Be familiar with it. There's nothing shameful about it. It is a wonderful gift. And I just want to say one other thing. This is so interesting. And I think, Jessica, I think we talked about this yesterday when we talked. Um, another book that I really love is this book, The Vagina Bible. This is an awesome book. This came out last year. And this is kind of like, you know, 30 years ago, moms were giving their daughters a book called Our Bodies, Ourselves. Well, this is a new book for moms to give their daughters. And it's just a real, it's a, just a beautiful down to earth discussion of what do you do? What's it like down there? What's normal down there? Uh, the vaginal microbiome, genital hygiene, you know, what's the right soap to use? Should you use a rinse? Should you use soap? Uh, toilet tissue, all that sort of stuff like that. And one of the things that, that she taught me in this book, and I should read this one again too, um, is that, um, you know, there's an, an entire billion dollar industry based on telling women they're dirty. Douches. What? They tell you you're dirty. 
and you should be clean. Please use my douche and you will be clean, right? And that's something she really rails against is the amazing thing about the vagina is that it's actually one of the cleanest organs in the human body because it sloughs off its skin every four hours every four hours. So for anybody to tell you that your vagina is dirty and you should use a douche, they don't understand, you know, crap about how the vagina is built. The vagina is actually a remarkably clean organ. And when you douche, you're actually disrupting that good, healthy, normal vaginal uh, flora that's keeping it healthy. And yes, after your menopausal, things change, your acid levels change, your pH levels change, you can have changes in your flora and end up with some bacterial vaginosis just from aging, but that's a whole nother thing. But anyway, uh, you know, for women out there, I gave this to all the women in my family for Christmas and my, my nieces-in-law, you know, rolled their eyes and they're like, oh God, Jill, really? And I'm like, yeah, really, it's a great book. Check it out. I almost gave it to my nephews and I should, I should have done that. I should have just given it to my nephews. But one of my one of my nieces in law was like, uh, yeah, no, no, no. He doesn't need to know that. I will teach him. It's like, well, I know. I could disagree with that a little bit. Brenda says, how can Piora work for me, but Bladder Builder didn't? Any thoughts uh, about that? Yeah, um, well, Piora has resveratrol in it. Uh, so Piora is the formula that matches the formula used in the IC research study. And Piora doesn't have any bladder ingredients in it. It's just straight for neuropathic pain and pain and discomfort. And so, so you know, so maybe it's just the magic combination of the um, PEA and the resveratrol. But girl, I'm so happy it's working for you. That's awesome. We need more testimonials. If you have it, if anybody has success or testimonials from Bladder Builder, Bladder Rest, uh, Piora, or um, also you guys, uh, we have discontinued multi right and we are now selling the Bladder Smart Low Acid Multivitamin. And I'm taking this now myself. Um, and I'm really happy with it because the, the uh, um, uh, multi right is a really big meaty capsule. It's kind of hard to get down. This is a much, it's a, it, I mean, the multi right was a tablet, an oblong tablet. It was really big. This is a much easier to swallow capsule. So for those of you looking for a vitamin, you know, you could try this. It's a low acid vitamin. You know, traditional vitamins, multivitamins are well known to just be too acidic for us. And, you know, for anybody who's talked to me, I'm a less is more kind of person. I don't believe in taking vitamins every day. I don't, I don't take vitamins every day because I'm sensitive, but I will do them a couple of times a week. I only take my vitamin D and my vitamin B12 every day. I should be taking calcium every day. I'm not, I should be, I'm going to start. Kathy, that was me that went to the vitamin shop. And thank you so much for telling me about the bladder builder. You're awesome. Kathy, it's not just you. I mean, I have the vitamin shop conversation once a week with somebody. But Sarah, where can you find my website address? It's right there, hun. IC Network and then just do a dot org, O-R-G, IC Network dot org. I need to get a new sign that has a full website address. Nettie says, I have stage four kidney failure. Oh, hon, I'm so sorry. And other issues. This is by far the worst pain and inconvenience I've ever. Girl, I'm so sorry. Nettie, if you want to talk, feel free to give me a phone call this week through the IC Network office. I'd be happy to try to help if I can. Your case is, you know, pretty complex. I do have, I do have the potential of reaching out to other national experts to uh, get answers for complex cases. Rhonda says, been taking pre leaf for years for cheap foods. It does help. Yep. Holly says, I would rather be, rather the pain than dealing with the vision loss from the Elmeron. I, I completely agree with you. Although the, the good news is that we have so many things now that can do the same thing as Elmeron, or you can do an Elmeron installation. There's no reason to be in pain. You can do other bladder coatings like Bladder Rest, Bladder Builder, Sister Renew, Sister Protect, the new formula, reformulated Sister Protect. 
Gigi says, I wish they were exercising places and classes for the pelvic floor god. I hear ya. Susan said, recently I thought I would try chiropractic care because it worked well. Unfortunately, this time the chiropractor used a drop table. I know, Susan, got to be careful with that. Angie says, dry needling helps a lot, but it's not for the weak, that's for sure. Your pain has to be bad to deal with the pain, but worth it, yeah. Jessica said, severe IDBS for decades. It's also something that clear up when you went on the diet. Severe lifelong eczema too. Uh, you, know, you know, Jessica, if you want to write up your story, um, I need more patient stories for our winter magazine. If you're willing to do that tonight or tomorrow, and and talk a little bit about the diet you've done and all the things that it has helped you and cleared up. I would love to put that in our magazine, hon. My personal email address is icnetwork at mac.com for Macintosh computer, icnetwork at mac.com. Anybody who wants to write, you know, you're interested in writing and getting paid for it or you have a patient story to share or a success story to share or whatever, uh, good stories, bad stories, I like to hear it all. Because I can't educate others if I don't have your stories, if I don't know what's happening. Holly says, books are hard to read, hard for me to read due to eye issues. You know, Holly, um, I, you know, now that I know who the publisher is of this book um, and I have contact with them, I was actually... Uh, I actually proposed the idea of doing um, a, a, a video with Dr. Weiss to go over some of this. And in my, and they haven't said yes or anything. Um, uh, I think we could break each chapter in this book down to a video so that you could, you could hear it. And um, that's one of the reasons why I'm talking about it so much. So I, I, I'm going to see what I can do, okay? I would love to uh, bring my computers down to him and just film, you know, kind of like discussions about each chapter. I think that it would, I think that this is, this is incredibly important work. Jessica says, I just took this offline. Moralgia parastica is a condition characterized by tingling, numbness, or burning pain in your outer thigh. The cause is compression of the nerve that supplies sensation to the skin surface of your thigh. We are so complex. But I'm sure it must have, have to be some reason. I get a bit annoyed when doctors say there's nothing that can be done. So, okay. So, Jessica, he talks about that in the book. He talks about how he, the evaluation he does to determine if nerves are also involved. And he assesses skin sensitivity. If the skin in the area is sensitive, then he knows that the nerves in the area are also involved. And one of the things that he does, that he does that he was the first to do is something called a subcutaneous infusion of lidocaine, where if dry, needle, if dry needling doesn't work and even anesthesia of the trigger point doesn't work or if they're dealing with a lot of, of um, congestion in the subcutaneous area, the subcutaneous area, you've got skin, you've got muscle. In between the skin and the muscle is a layer of blood vessels and fat that control your body temperature. And uh, um, that area can become very stiff and painful when nerves are involved. And so he was doing infusions of lidocaine into the sub-Q area over where the tingling was. And had tremendous success with that, Jessica. So I have to wonder if that might be helpful. You guys, I again, right now on my laptop, I'm working on this whole line of questions for him for an interview. If you have any questions for Dr. Wise, please email them to me, icnetwork at mac.com, and I tr will try to get them in the, into my interview with them.
Carol, let's see. Carol says, I have IC, IBS, thyroid, many other issues. It sucks. I spent all my time in the bathroom. I'm now dairy to eat gluten-free diet, and I still have problems. My nutritionist wants me to eliminate sugar, too. I have no idea what to eat. Carol, you're going to go back to eat what your ancestors were eating. Fresh meat, fresh vegetables, uh, and, uh, maybe, you know, maybe rice. You know, I so I got icy for, well, let's say I had frequency urgency first in junior high. Got vulvodynia in high school, got IBS in my 20s, and then I was diagnosed with IC in my 30s. They are all now completely controlled. Uh, oh, and I got thyroid, a low thyroid in my 20s also. Um, I will just tell you that, that in my case, uh, doing an elimination diet, trying to find the foods that my body body tolerated well was really critical to getting the IBS under control. As an example, when my IBS hit, my first attack was on my break when I worked for Social Security. I ate, I had an oatmeal cookie, a chocolate chip oatmeal cookie and a glass of milk. I spent hours laying in the, writhing on the bathroom floors with an IBS attack at work. I mean, my male supervisor even came into the bathroom to find out what was wrong with me. It was terrible. Um, what the doctor said at that time was to eat oatmeal. You know, their assumption was it was a bowel driven issue. Remember Western medicine breaks things into organs, whereas Dr. Weiss talks about how they inter interrelate. So my doctors back then, you know, were saying, you know, you need to eat oatmeal. And so believe me, I was eating oatmeal every day. I was putting oat bran on everything and I was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And I, I ended up every morning at about 11 o'clock, I would be laying in the fetal position on my bed with bowel spasms. I mean, I don't know how, I mean, that all started with that one event. And then I left that job and went to grad school and this was all going on during grad school. And my sister gave me a book, which I still have. Where is it? Here it is. This is a book. Man, this book is 30 freaking years old. My sister, after about a year of me, or a year or two of me going through this, gave me this book. And it's not available now. It's way off print. But it talked about not just allergies, but sensitivities. I never understood sensitivities. And then it gave you a plan. And the first thing it said to do was number one, stop dairy. So when I stopped dairy, I definitely noticed a difference. I still had terrible cramping, but it wasn't as mucousy or intense, but it was still there. And then the second thing it said is, all right, stop all the grains for a week, all your grain, or, or at least for several days. So rice, barley, rye, corn, wheat, just, just stop everything. Just stop everything for three or four days. Give your body or two days, whatever, whatever you can do to give your body a little bit of break. As soon as I stopped oatmeal, it all went away. I, uh, and it was oatmeal and chocolate that were triggering my bowel spasms. Um, and so that elimination diet takes a lot of time. The other thing you could do is something called food sensitivity testing. The company that does it is Alcat, A-L-C-A-T, Alcat where you send your blood in and they can test it with various foods to see if you have a sensitivity reaction. When you have an allergy to something, you get a rash, you get difficulty breathing, your throat swells. When you have a sensitivity to something, it provokes a different type of reaction. It's not life-threatening, but it's very, very uncomfortable. And so, you know, it would have been really nice to have been able to go back in time and have that sensitivity testing because it took me, I'm going to say four years to really figure out the culprits. And the culprits for, for me were oatmeal, chocolate, and at the time, sunflower seeds. Uh, and there was one other thing. I don't remember what it was. A uh, Coke. I wouldn't do, I couldn't do anything like that. This was before the IC. Um, and then ironically, I will tell you, it, I went through uh, about six years ago, this whole gastritis thing. 
where my stomach was really, really bad. And again, it was going back on the elimination diet. And what I learned from that is I was diagnosed with gastroparesis, which is delayed stomach emptying. And what turned off my pain in my stomach was not eating lettuce. As soon as I stopped eating lettuce, leafy greens, all of my stomach pain went away. So we're all wired so differently, right? You know, and understanding the connection between all these is hard. It's hard. Like, I don't understand why I, some I see patients flare when they eat probio when they eat acidophilus. I, that baffles me. I don't get it. Why would eating a beneficial bacteria trigger flares in some patients? But it does. It's weird. Tyler says, I'm scheduled for a bladder distension. It's, is it worth it? You know what? Listen, I don't like guessing. I like facts. And uh, hydrodistension allows somebody to look at your bladder. I mean, if you're having long-term bladder symptoms and you're in pain or you've got blood in your urine, there comes a point in time where you want somebody to look at the organ. Absolutely. And if it comes out that your bladder is good, that is fantastic news. Uh, then we can step away from bladder therapies and focus instead on muscles and nerves. And that's, you know, on... Uh, uh, where before, 20 years ago, if they said your bladder was healthy, they would have just told you it was all in your head. Now, today, we know if your bladder's healthy, now we just have to look at other structures in the pelvis. And if you're like most guys that I work with, I bet we can find some sort of pelvic trauma in your history. Uh, so the thing with the hydrodistension is, so in the old days, you know, we got to remember, being a doctor is a fairly macho uh, profession. And in the old days, they kind of thought that the more you stretch the bladder, the better, uh, that it would trigger some healing and it kind of breaks some nerves so you feel better, you know, for the short term. So in the old days, they used to do something called high pressure, long duration hydrogestensions where they put a lot of fluid in your bladder and then they blocked it so the fluid stayed in your bladder for a period of time. And then they held it in there for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever to really try to stretch the bladder out. But if you look at the American Urology Association guidelines for IC, they no longer recommend that. They instead want you to do a low pressure, short duration procedure to minimize trauma to the bladder. So, so instead of overfilling it, we, they only fill it to the point where they can get a good picture. And instead of keeping it in for a long period of time, they keep it in for a short period of time. And that dramatically reduces trauma to the bladder. If you over hydrodistend the bladder, there's a risk of rupture, especially if you've got very thin areas of your bladder wall, let's say from Hunter's lesion. So a less is more approach is viable. I had one three years ago after my hysterectomy, very, very grateful I did that because we learned that my bladder wasn't damaged by the surgery. Don't regret it at all. It was short term. It was low pressure, no harmful side effects. Um, Tyler, the other thing to think about is, is you need to have a discuss. you have to have a really good discussion with your doctor before they do it, because number one, you got to talk about how they're going to do it. High pressure versus low pressure. Number two, you've got to talk about what are they going to do if they find something, if they find a hunter's lesion as an example, that's the time you treat it. If they find it, you treat it. And it's amazing the number of patients who have hydrodistensions, they're told they have Hunter's lesions and they get no therapy for it. And that is a great, great tragedy because what it means then is you're gonna to have to have another one eventually to treat the lesion correctly. So you wanna have a good proactive discussion with him, with your doctor, him or her, about what their intentions are if they see something abnormal in your bladder like a Hunter's lesion. Will they be doing a biopsy uh, and or uh, if they see Hunter's lesions, how do they intend to treat the lesion? And if the doctor says, well, I'm not going to treat anything, that would be the time to step back, in my opinion. Because what that means is that doctor doesn't have the equipment or the skills to do it. And I would probably ask for a referral to another doctor. That would be mine. And then the third thing I think that's important to consider with a hydrodistension, as well as if they do a biopsy, is pain management and pain control. 
uh, because when you stretch a hollow organ like your stomach or your bladder, when you stretch it, it hurts. Some people have a hydro, uh, obviously it's done, in, uh, it's done in the outpatient unit of a hospital. It's done with very mild sedation, like something like propofol. Um, so it's very easy to wake up afterwards. Uh, you're not supposed to be awake when you have it done because when you stretch your bladder, it's going to hurt. Um, uh, some people, they go out to dinner that night, not a problem. Other people, if it's overstretched or they've got a very, very small bladder and whatever, uh, uh, they might be in pain for a couple weeks. And so I think it, or at least a couple days. So having a discussion with your doctor about what does he intend to do if you have a pain complication is important. Um, uh, what I do for any aggressive testing, um, I demand a pain prescription ahead of time. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to wait until I'm numbed up and out of my head after having a procedure, hoping and praying they're going to give me a prescription as I walk out the door. I'm very upfront with them up, up you know, at the pre-op meeting, it's like, okay, I expect pain medicine. I don't need a lot. You know, give me a couple days worth. I want the prescription in my hand so that they can't fake me out at the hospital and not give me anything, you know, which has happened to other people. So I hope that helped Tyler. KD says, does anybody else have more bladder pain when they have their period? You know what? Actually, KD, uh, you, should, you should get this book because this kind of talks about some of the things that happen during your period. One of the things that she talked about in here that I had never heard of but had certainly experienced is something called period diarrhea, where you can be more, more prone to having episodes of diarrhea when you have your, when you have your period. I never knew there was connection. I mean, I totally remember that happening to me several times. So you might get a good answer out of this book. Um, but some, it, sometimes the bladder wall is influenced by changes in hormones. But it's also more quite likely that you're having more bladder pain because you're cramping. If you're cramping, your muscles are getting tight. And when their muscles are tight, that's impacting your bladder. That's you know. So I would expect that that could be a pelvic floor spasm that you might be having. Penny says, why does it hurt my kidneys area too? And, and sometimes your lower back because Penny, you, you have psoas muscles that go up your lower, from your pelvis, up your lower back. And these are big meaty muscles. They're like this big. Uh, I have a picture of it. And it's often the psoas muscle that gets tight and painful in your lower back and in the area, in that area. Um, that's a, one of the nice things about, again, about this book is they hired an illustrator who I think did a wonderful job, um, especially the deep stuff. Let me see if I can... The one thing this book does not have is an index at the end. I just, they did not, I think they just got to the point where they just wanted to get it out and indexing would probably have added another year or two or not a year, six months to publication. All right. So let's look at these muscles here for a moment. So your psoas here, here are, let's see, your ilia, iliacus muscles and your psoas muscles. So these are anchored in your pelvis. This is along the backside and they, they come up and they're anchored in your low back. But look, they, they anchor right to your femur. And so again, if you've got one leg longer than the other and you've got this, you know, your hips are not functioning evenly, then that's going to tweak that muscle and that's going to tweak the muscles up in your low back too. You also have the quadratus lumborum muscle. Um, he talks here about trigger points and where the trigger points are, which I thought was fascinating. So on the piriformis muscles, the little orange spots here are the areas where uh, they normally do, what did he say here? Typical needling locations in the external points of the hip rotators, right? 
and so these are the ones I don't know about you guys but I do have moments when my inner thighs get very tight or my outer thighs sometimes even when I walk my uh, a muscle like pops over another muscle in my thigh so anyway so say so, so these are your sit bones right here these u-shaped bones and these are muscles that attach the sit bones down to your leg so he gives the typical uh, dry needling locations and looks and your glute muscles I have constant issues right here on my glute max but I also get issues up here on my left side it's low on my right side it's high which is kind of the imbalance so you can see how freaking good look at this if you have issues with your thighs or the backs of your legs these are your hamstrings and uh also the other thing i thought was interesting these are the rectus abdominis muscles so you know that it's that great six-pack muscle that you get i didn't realize the six-pack muscle also connects directly to your sacrum and your and in that area down there um it's absolutely fascinating really great great anatomy lesson in that book i have times will wear three body heat heating pads up my left side, one on my glute, one at my waist, and one higher up to deal with that constant uh, uh, muscle tension on my left side. Carrie, 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 Ace Study. Tyler's saying, um, what about inner stem? What about inner stem? You know, inner stem has a place. Uh, inner stem is, and, and uh, interestingly, okay, so here's an interesting story. Uh, this is a fascinating story, actually. Um, so back in the early 80s, when he was a young doctor and young urologist, and very quickly came to see that his urology training uh, in bladder issues, et cetera, was not meeting the needs of his patient population. And he turned to muscles after a paper was published by the guy who invented Interstem. So Richard Schmidt and uh, Dr. Tanago were the team at UC San Francisco that created Interstem. And, and I will tell you, they were very controversial. You know, I mean, Richard, Dr. Schmidt was basically left the university in, contra, in, in controversy. Um, uh, uh, the early days of Interstem were rough. Okay, but what led to the development of Interstem was the fact that in overactive bladder patients, they could see that muscles were spasming in overactive bladder. Um, and they came to believe that overactive bladder frequency urgency were directly the result of muscle dysfunction. And they invited Dr. Weiss over to their clinic and showed it to him. And that's one of the things that turned Dr. Weiss to look much more in depth at muscle function and how that influenced bladder. So inner stem, you know, is neuromodulation. So the theory behind inner stem is that you use a minor nerve, nerve impulse to kind of calm muscles and nerves. And the early days of inner stem were brutal. They were absolutely brutal. The technology was very new. They were doing trials without anesthesia. I was the support group leader for those patients. Uh, my group was filled with inner stem complication patients. I had one guy in my group who... I've always wondered how he was, you know, how he ended up in the end who literally wanted to slug somebody. And anytime the doctor's name came up because he felt so badly harmed by him. But the, it was very quickly sold to Medtronic. Other doctors became involved. The units were made smaller, the units were made better. And um, inner stem has a place. It has a place. It can, especially for people who are incontinent, there is a place for inner stem. But 
you know, it, it, it is a surgical intervention. You have foreign metal objects in your body. You cannot have MRI. There are things you will not be able to do. There are hundreds, thousands of complications with the USF filed with the USDA over interstem. I mean, there are fatalities with interstem, changes in heart rhythm, all sorts of things. So you cannot walk into interstem uh, thinking that it is entirely safe and effective. And if you go to our website, icnetwork.org, go to the section on interstem, I have the link to the FDA database. You can search that database yourself for interstem. There, there are side effects and adverse events reported almost every day with interstem. In contrast, rather than doing neuromodulation that involves surgery, you can do neuromodulation with an acupuncture needle and a vector to the nerve. It's called, uh, it's called urgent PC. And that's what I did 25 years ago in the summer of 1993. Uh, is it 27 years ago now, this year? Um, I was referred to UC San Francisco. One group of patients went to Interstem and one group of patients went to, to Dr. Stoller and the ankle stem. And all I can say is I feel very blessed that I ended up in the ankle stem group. Um, and what they did instead, and I can show you, let's see if I can contort myself. Okay. So I don't know if you can see it. See that little black spot there? That I have little tattoos on my inner legs and it's three finger widths above the ankle bone. So here's the ankle bone, three finger widths above the ankle bone. And then it's like, it's not quite two finger widths down. And then they have to, you have to put the nerve, you have to put the needle in at a special angle. Um, and so, the advantage of this way of doing it is there's no surgery. Uh, it, the pain is minimal at best. If uh, sometimes they hit the bone, that doesn't hurt. Uh, if they hit a nerve, that will hurt. They just pull the needle out and they go to the other leg instead. Um, and that's what broke me out of that terrible year-long flare that I was in, uh, was we did 10, 11, 12, treatments of inner stem and then they gave me the tattoos and they taught me how to do it at home. Now, the original intent with inner stem was to create a little dime size device that they could implant at that spot. Uh, it's called SP6, it's an acupuncture point. Um, that was the original intention by Dr. Stoller who invented this. Um, his company went out of business and Urgent PC came along and I believe Urgent PC has now done uh, clinical trials showing success with an implantable little, little tiny thing up by your ankle. So to me, um, most people start with the ankle stimulation. It's a hell of a lot cheaper. I want to just say one other thing about Interstem and this is a true story. I had a nurse call me with an Interstem billing nightmare um, she lived in a small town on the East Coast in one of the Appalachian countries. There were only three urologists in town for her IC. Every single one of them told her she had to do interstem. She felt pressured into it, but she agreed to do it. Uh, but she was smart in the sense that she was like, well, okay, I better make sure I got my ducks in a row when it comes to money because I don't have a hell of a lot of money. So she asked the doctor's billing office, is this covered by insurance? They said, absolutely, no pre-authorization is required. She then called the hospital itself that she worked at as a nurse and their billing department and said, is this covered by my insurance? They said, yes, no written authorization is required. And she did her due diligence. She called the company and said, is this covered by my insurance? The company said, absolutely, you're fine. She agreed to the surgery. She did not get it in writing. Two weeks after the surgery, they, she got a bill for $80,000, somewhere in there, and that with a threat to garnish her wages. And you know, she goes back to everybody. Hey, you told me it was covered. 
I don't have $80,000 to give you. You lied to me. And I think they garnished her wages. So you gotta, if you, one thing with Interstim is, man, get it all in writing. You get that doctor to put in writing it's covered. You get the hospital to cover it's rubber, it, to put in writing and, and get that it covered. You get the, you get the company to do it too. So that you can get yourself covered if that happens. Cause that was disgraceful. Another thing that, another thing about Interstim is it requires long-term constant care. It is not something they can implant and then send you on your way for years uh, because it can malfunction. It needs to be monitored. Uh, the other thing that we have noticed is that let's say you have inter you've got a great job, you've got great health insurance, and the health insurance pays for the interstand. And a year later, you lose your job and you lose your health insurance. Some doctors are dropping patients. And we had one patient who that happened to, she was on Medicaid and her device malfunctioned and she was getting shocked. She was getting shocked by it. And that doctor refused to see her because she couldn't, she didn't have insurance anymore. She called me sobbing. I got her connected with the company and, and we played really, we played hardball with the company. It's like, Hey, you guys did this. You need to make this better. This patient is having an adverse event. You need to find a doctor who will take insur her insurance. There was one doctor in the state of Florida, the entire state of Florida, who would take Medicaid and work with Interstem. And so um, I think it's very, very important that you ask your doctor, will you care for me if I lose my health insurance? And if the answer is no, you say, then where will I go? And if he says, I don't know, that, again, is another reason I think not just take a step back and go, hmm, maybe we need to do something that does not involve surgery and constant monitoring like urgent PC first. Thank you, Trudy. Kathy says, I spoke to you recently about my bladder and decided I was subtype five. I forgot to mention I have 100. Kathy, seriously, you forgot to tell me you had 100. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> yes, you absolutely can be two subtype. Listen, central sensitization, especially if you're a redhead, that's just the landscape. That's just us. That's how we're built. And it's important to understand that we're sensitive. That's why we have such extreme reactions to irritating things like bites and stuff like that. So yeah, you can absolutely have two subtypes. I'm two subtypes. I'm I'm subtype five, subtype three. I'm central sensitization pelvic floor, you know? Remember, I we don't think of central sensitization as a disease process. It's an injury. It's either genetics or an injury. Hey, you guys. Let's take a bio break. I need to go get some water. I will be right back. One minute break. I'll see you on the other side.
ready then. Uh, sitting. Oh my God, sitting for a long period of time. That's hard. A little stretch. Oh. <sighs> Getting old. Oh my God. I used to be able to sit for eight or nine hours, but as Dr. Weiss talks about in the book, when you're young and you got young bones and young muscles, your muscles are very, very resilient. When you're older, you start suffering wear and tear injuries. I have wear and tear injuries. Time for some LaCroix. Sparkling water. Ice. Bladder friendly. At least it's bladder for bladder friendly for me now. Does anybody flare from from sparkling water now? Becca says I was put on antibiotics for a year a while back. My new doctor was shocked. Yep. Welcome to the old days, my friends. That's the way we were all treated. That way, now you know why so many of us have had issues, right? And I apologize for this, but when I talk a lot, everything gets dry. So it is what it is. Jacqueline says, is it common for IC patients to have a microscopic blood in their urine? Yeah. If your bladder wall is injured, it's going to leak. It's going to leak a little bit of blood, but it's usually microscopic blood. It's usually not that worrisome. If you've got visible blood in your urine, that is a whole nother story. If you're peeing blood clots, you got to get to the emergency room. Call your doctor right away. Lisa is, as in hypersensitive to food, smells, medicine, other people's moods, maybe I'm special. No, Lisa, that is called central sensitization. I have the same thing. Becky says, Jill, I'm really interested in what you, you would have to say about the fascia blaster. I've not heard of it. Check it out, please. I don't know anything about it. Lisa says, are most of us hypersensitive? No, no, really. I mean, it's amazing the number of patients who call who are not sensitive at all. I mean, I'm always surprised because I always thought most people were sensitive. But remember, sensitivity is, is inherited. A lot of the people are kind of redheads, Northern European. Those are the, those of us who are blessed this way. Uh, and the other people, it's a result of injury that when you sustain an injury, nerves become more sensitive. Andrea says, no matter how much I try to explain how it feels to have IC to my family members, they say it's always something wrong with you. They just don't understand. You know, hon, that's why I, I do these lectures, um, because you can show them a video. Like, it would be really good to show them the first part of this video. Uh, you know, like the first half hour, 45 minutes of this video. Um, uh, and, and again, the, the subtypes matter, the different variations, but, you know, ultimately in the end, it's about injury. It's about trauma to the pelvis. Something has happened. I mean, no, none of us asked for this, for God's sake. None of us, I had no idea scoliosis would mess up my muscles and give me frequency urgency. I had no idea. You know, um, and, and so that's not my fault. That's not my parents' fault. It just is what it is. It, it just happened. Um, but to blame somebody, I think the word sensitive has been weaponized. Oh, you're just sensitive. Get over it. You know, that's very cruel. Sensitivity is there for a reason. It's a survival mechanism. Every tribe needed somebody sensitive. who could smell good water versus bad water. So every family needs somebody sensitive. We're, listen, we're going to smell the fire first. That's a good thing. You know, we can save lives because of our sense of smell. I've now found three gas leaks in, in, uh, my neighborhood, including one coming out, gas leaking out, bubbling out of my, my street right out here, a couple of houses away. And uh, I mean, it was strong. I could smell it. Other people couldn't smell as much as I could. We called the fire department. They wanted to evacuate the street and we, and they brought in PG, PG e our gas company. And they were like, yeah, there's gas leak here. Um, and they tore up the entire street and fixed everything, you know? So Anyway, Jessica says, I don't like it when doctors use the words chronic and progressive. I have more than one day, but I see it's not curable too. Like my, J 
Jessica, I really think that this book is going to blow your mind. And I think the subcutaneous infusions of lidocaine, they actually might, I, I, I mean, it would just be fascinating to bring that up with your doctor and see if that's a viable option for you. I don't know. Lori says, I had a hydro done January 9th under anesthesia. It took about three to four weeks to feel better. My bladder issues are burning frequency, nerve pain with pelvic pain. Hello, Deborah. Janice, having to find a new doctor, your gynecologist, because of new insurance, it's awful. It is. It is. Jessica, I'd like to know about all this dust that comes off the toilet paper these days. Hey, you know, oh my God. Oh, I'm really glad you brought that up because I noticed that too. Like I just saw that again because I ran out. I, I, I was having weird skin sensitivity down there last year. And um, uh, I noticed that the Costco toilet paper that I usually buy, you usually buy three big bins at a time. You know, you care for two elderly parents, you go through a lot of toilet paper. And there was just something that didn't seem right. And so I switched to, uh, well, actually, I think it was the Vagina Bible. I think it was this Bible that talked about that. And so I switched to a bamboo toilet paper. And the bamboo toilet papers do not let off hardly any dust. You know, because that dust is ending on your skin and embedding on your skin too. So I really like using the more environmentally environmentally friendly bamboo uh, toilet paper rather than the generic cheap toilet papers, uh, you know, that we've all come to hate. I just hate that they, you know, they're imported from Asia. It'd be nice to have a bamboo toilet paper that's made in the United States, but it is what it is. Tyler says, does anybody use antibiotics but has had negative bacteria culture and it helps? Tyler, um, uh, um, uh, there's a, uh, antibiotics have an anti-inflammatory effect. And so many people take antibiotics and they feel better. They think they're killing infection when in fact what's happening is that the anti-inflammatory effect is making them feel better. Um, uh, it would be very, very, if you think you have infection, you need to do, and it would be interesting to do a next generation urine test. You can go to bladderhealth.org to learn more about it um, because that will tell us the good bacteria, the bad bacteria, and most importantly, fungal infections because it was our own National Institutes of Health who discovered that many I see patients having flares don't have bacterial flares. They are having fungal in flares and like candida flares. And a typical urine test was, does not test for fungal infections. But next, this type of testing, next generation testing would. And then again, most importantly, it also shows antibiotic resistance genes. It will tell you how to treat it correctly or antifungal resistant genes. But antibiotics, it should, again, we have mega issues about antibiotics now, destroying the biome and, and dramatically increasing your risk of, of nosocomial, I mean, of antibiotic resistant infections. And yes, there is a, a, an outspoken group of patients um, and uh, one or two doctors in the world who believe patients can have chronic embedded UTI and they recommend antibiotic therapy for that. That is not widely accepted. Um, uh, and again, you are an anatomical mystery to be solved. Uh, and so I say, go for a full evaluation. If you think you have infection, do the infection test, do the next gen test. If you think it's muscle, do the, have your pelvis assessed. I will just tell you in my experience working with guys for 27 years now, 95% of the guys that I've worked with, we can go right back and find a muscle injury. And it's that muscle injury that's triggering frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, uh, every week, every week it happens in my office. So if you want to talk about it, feel free to give me a phone call. Just go over to icnetwork.org and you can send me a message on our contact us page, or you can email me icnetwork at mac.com. You guys can call our office 1-800-928-7496. The direct phone number is at the top of every, uh, page of our website. 
Uh, if I answer the phone, woohoo, you got me. If I don't answer the phone, that means I'm working with somebody else or I'm on deadline. I'm on deadline this week with my magazine. And so I might not be able to call back quite as quickly. I've got to get my magazine out. Carrie says redheads are the best synthesizers of vitamin D. I didn't know that. Nikki, Nettie says, all this is so hard to understand. There's so much to learn on this disease. Hun, but you don't use the word disease. Don't use the word disease. Think injury, trauma. Okay? And that's why, Nettie, if you want to give, it, give a phone call this week, I'd be happy to try to talk to you and work you through some of these if you have confusions. Hello, Sue. Sue says, you've been reading the book for a week. There's so much information There's a, with a lot of medical terms. I, I too, also learn better hearing and video. I'm probably going to have to reread the. You know, I'm the same way, Sue. That's why I've read it twice. Um, and I take lots of notes. I, I skimmed it the first time, didn't take notes. Jaw dropped. And then went back and had to dedicate time every day to reading a chapter a day. Took a lot of notes and uh, that improved my comprehension of it substantially. But having your iPad there, your iPhone there so you can look up words. I do that all the time. I do that all the time with medical words. That's a, one, of the, one of the blessings of the Internet is we can do that. I agree, Jessica. Carrie says, for Dr. Weiss, how do I how get my doctor to get curious and engage with me in a productive... Oh, God. Oh, my God. Carrie. Holy hell. That's a great question. Hold on. Hold on. Ah, come on. Turn on you, son of a gun. There you go. Carrie, awesome question. I'm answer I'm adding it right now. How do I get my doctor to get curious and engage with me in a productive way? Awesome question. Anybody else have questions for Dr. Weiss? Uh, how many words for a testimonial? A couple sentences. Sue says she's having a TENS unit trial on 228. You're a little nervous. Are you having an interstim trial on the 28th? Or are you having an urgent PC trial? Tanya says, what's the name of the book? It is called Breaking Through Chronic Pelvic Pain, A Holistic Approach for Relief by Dr. Jerome Weiss. You will be able to, to buy it for $5 off on our website on, as soon as we get it and put it out Tuesday or Wednesday. Hopefully. They've already shipped it. I got to send them a check. Carrie, I'd love to talk to you at some point in time about that study. The uh, Adverse Childhood Event Study. Elizabeth said her inner stem trial was horrible, so she did not proceed. You know, I mean, the thing with inner stem, guys, is, is that, you know, when inner when inner stem went from being kind of a research study to a national thing and Medtronic had it, their marketing pitch was was really icky. Um, I call them the Darth Vader of the IC world because the way they pitched it at the conferences, and I was there, so I witnessed it. So the way inner stem was kind of pitched was. 
You know, those patients who drive you crazy, who call you all the time, you can get rid of them by implanting this device. And what happened was kind of doctors around the country, uh, one in particular in Utah, I don't remember his name, saw this as a great money-making opportunity. And so every patient coming in uh, diagnosed with quote unquote IC, we're told the only treatment was for inner stem. And he basically created an inner stem factory where he had every patient, they weren't even told about diet. They weren't even told about Elmeron. They were just told inner stem. And eventually a couple of patients reached out to me, some of it had complications. And we kind of learned about what was happening here and how these patients were not being educated and informed, not only about IC, but basic self-help and stuff like that. And so Interstim left a very, very kind of bad taste in my mouth. Um, uh, and then throw in the fact that, uh, you know, again, I ran the support group for those first Interstim patients. And this, there, in those early days, the stories were absolutely terrible. And so I saw it as my responsibility to advocate with company on their behalf. And one of the things that that I pushed very, very hard for was anesthesia during trials. Can you imagine having an inner stim lead placed at your lower spine with no anesthesia? I mean, we had patients screaming. One mother and her son uh, were seeing Dr. Schmidt at UC San Francisco. And um, uh, the doctor just said, hey, we've got this new thing we could do. It's called Interstim. We could do it for you today. And the mom says, sure. And the son's like, sure. She goes out of the room. The next thing she hears is her son screaming because they weren't using anesthesia at the time. And so I was the one who stepped in with a company and just nailed their ass and said, how dare you do this? I mean, that young man was terribly, terribly uh, affected by that experience. And then the other thing that was happening with Interstim was that doctors weren't listening to patients after it was done for patients who had problems. They kept throwing, you know, they kept saying, well, it's just post-op recovery. It's just, you got to give it time. You're still healing. And we had one, one young girl who I think was in Oklahoma who did the trial and it was very, very successful. She was very enthusiastic, wanted to have the implant. So she had the surgery. And as soon as she woke up from the implant, she knew immediately there was a problem and they wouldn't listen to her. It's like, guys, it hurt. This is bad. This hurts. And they blew her off for like three months. It was getting worse and worse and then she couldn't walk and they had to do an emergency surgery, opened her up. Her belly was filled with rusty battery fluid and she had, um, um, oh, oh, you know, the tissue was dying. What do you call it? Gangrene, she had gangrene around, around the lead um, and around the body and it was just terrible. And she tried to tell them. So that was the other thing that I advocated for patients for is that surely there had to be some mechanism for which patients could give feedback to doctors immediately after surgery that would be believed because they weren't believing the patients. And it wasn't just one patient. Lots of patients were having issues, as is evidenced by the FDA database and all the complaints there. So... So Brenda said she had an inner stim done in 2014. It was wonderful. Helped a little bit with your pain. Had to have the battery replaced in 2019. Uh, and because of my pelvic pain, which you did not have in 2014, you turned it off. It was making it work. Yeah. Yeah, t uh, post tibial nerve stimulation. It was actually invented by Dr. Marshall Stoller at UC San Francisco. I was one of his patients. Lori Chavez says, do you have recommendations for office chairs for pelvic floor pain? Uh, yes, I do. Um, 
so I have gone through so many chairs. I've got two office chairs sitting in my garage right now that did not work. Uh, the the second to the last chair I bought was a Lazy Boy with a lot of padding. Uh, it it lasts. I just I it's just not good enough. And so I just bought this one. And I wish you could see it on. It's called. It's called an all 33 chair. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but the, the bottom half of the chair um, moves. And, um, and so I think it's, I think it's really good because now instead of having to have a pillow behind me back, which you guys used to see all the time when I stood up, you'd see this big pillow. This, when I sit in it, I have tremendous lower back support and um, it, it, it's very padded. Um, so it's called all33.com, A-L-L-33.com. I saw an advertisement for it somewhere and uh, I'm impressed with it. Uh, I think it's the best I've got right now and now I don't have any lower back pain but dealing with the trigger points in my glute muscles is I still can't sit for long periods of time but I'm I'm sitting better I'm sitting a lot lot better it's, it was like Lori it was like 750 bucks 800 bucks sorry but I have to work I have to work I got so much work to do so I went for it uh, but they also offer full returns I think it's either a 60, I think it's a 60 day return. You can get it. And if it doesn't work for you, you can send it right back and get all your money back. So check out all33.com. All right, we've been going for about three and a half hours now. So what do we, uh, what do you say? Is it time for a giveaway? Okay, hold on. If, see, if I do a giveaway, I'm going to lose some discussions here. Okay, so look at that. I'm on. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, so, so. My gift, my gift to you, my gift to you. I got two copies. It's worth 70 bucks out of, out of my pocket, but you know what? It's my job. I love my job. And I want to help you. I want to make you better. I want to help you feel better. So, so we're going to give away one on Facebook, one on YouTube. Uh, so I'm not going to make it easy on you. We'll see how good you are at paying attention. And you know what? I might even just give away a couple bottles of Sister Protect too. What do you say, baby? What do you say? So let's see. What would be a good question? So the question we, okay, no, I, we can't use this. Well, okay. You see, some of you were at the meeting last Sunday. I don't want to use the same question. Uh, and it was a good question. Darn it. No, nope, that's too easy. Okay. We need a good, we got to have a good question. Um. All right. All right. Now some of you, oh, some of you might not have been here, but let's see. In what century was interstitial cystitis first described in a medical journal? In what century was interstitial cystitis first described in a medical journal? That's your question. First book on Facebook, first person on YouTube, gets it right, it's going to get a book. Let's 
was it all right len nolo on youtube oh okay uh, okay i uh, okay let's see let me look at your answers here nicole nicole hall on facebook and len nolo len nolo on youtube you guys are the winners don technically you're correct too you just came in a second ahead of time because it is the 1800s which technically was the 19th century but the answer is the 1800s or the 19th century and so len len nolo oh okay oh i hate it when i screw up a question like that okay um all right i'm gonna give away four books i'm giving away four books because i made a mistake okay len nolo don stat on youtube you are winners nicole jessica j on facebook you are winners you're you're all winners okay i'm gonna send out four I'm sending out four books. All right. So uh, hold on. I got to write this down. I got to write this down. Come on. Where is my. Here it is. All right. So I'm getting I'm going to give out four books because I screwed up that question. Crap. Oh, well, that's OK. OK, I need a, I need a pen. Hold on. Okay, so it is Nicole Hall, Jessica J on Facebook, and it is Len Nolo and Dawn Stat on YouTube. Okay, if you could please send your mailing address right now to icnetwork at mac.com. icnetwork at mac.com. Send you send me your mailing address and I will I will send them out on Tuesday. Tomorrow is a holiday. Lan, you got one too, hun. So you're so four out there. And you know what? Listen, just because I effed it up. I effed it up. And because I happen to have giveaways here that I was going to use. Okay. Oh, do you want something? Does anybody want a bottle of Sister Protec? I could save these for next Sunday. Oh, Hege says you're celebrating Mother's Day in Norway today. Aw, uh, I love my Norwegian family. You guys, good guesses. Good, good, good guesses. I know, David, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And so, but I was looking for 1800s. It was my mistake. That's why I'm giving four books out. But because I effed it up, I must make amends. I must make amends. It is my job to make amends. So my amends is I'm also going to give away some Sisto Protect. What do you say? So for this one, so this is the new reformulated Sisto Protect without any of the titanium dioxide. Uh, it's been out for a month now, so, and there are always a group of people, people love the new ones, the bladder builder, the bladder rest, but some of you really like the, the Sister Protect formula. So I got two bottles of that. We're going to give that out too, because it's my job to make amends when I screwed up like that. Okay, so now your question for the Sister Protect is, crap. We need another good question. Uh, 
Okay, this is only for people who are interested in trying Sisto Protec. If you are interested in trying Sisto Protec, here's your question. Oh, except I didn't, crap, I didn't talk about that in depth. Name one muscle of your pelvic floor. If you want a sister project, give me the name of any muscle in your pelvic floor. And yes, I know some of you are Googling that right now, and that's okay. If you want a sister project, one on Facebook, one on YouTube, you got to give me the name. Whoever gives me the name of a pelvic floor muscle. Oh, Carrie, that would have been a really good one. Oh, my God. Okay, Kay, on YouTube, you get one. Carol Josanio gets the second one. Kay on YouTube said Levator Ani. Carol on uh, Facebook said Piriformis. Melissa, you were also right, Obdurator, but... I'll be doing another, uh, I, we have another meeting scheduled for next Sunday, um, although it's at Daytona 500, and I like to watch that with my dad, but anyway. Uh, okay, Kay, I don't have your last name. Okay, so if you want the Sister Project, please send me an email, icnetwork at mac.com, and uh, we will see what we can do, all right? Ooh, I'm going to have a big postal bill this week. But that's okay. Okay, any questions for Dr. Weiss? Does anybody have any questions that you would like me to ask Dr. Weiss in my interview this week? Okay, hold on. I just heard a I heard a thump. I gotta make sure nobody fell. I thought you had fallen. Everything is fine. Nobody fell. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, guys. Listen, we've been going for three and a half hours. Uh, Carol Desania says, does Morton's toe help with Morton's neuroma? That's a good question. Let me add that. Okay, any other questions for Dr. Weiss? Let's say, uh, any other doctors that you know of that do a similar workup and treatment plan? Okay, got it. Frida says, uh, you mentioned hyaluronic acid before, recently saw it listed in some cosmetics, can't remember which product, is it safe? Yes, hyaluronic hyaluronic acid is a, a normal building a building block in your joints. It's a, uh, it's a, um, lubri it's a, like a joint lubricant. It's, it's found in tissues throughout the human body. If you were to ever have TMJ and they need to kind of uh, put a liquid in there to help it, it would probably be hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid uh, in the form of cystostat has been used as a bladder therapy for 25 years in, in an installation. It is part of Ialuril, which is a uh, hyaluronic chondroitin bladder installation. And it is used as a supplement with uh, in supplements like Sister Protec and Bladder Builder for its bladder coating effect. Okay, Kay, Kay's got some good questions here.
Okay, got it. Don, I think your email just came in. Thank you, Don. Frida says, um, uh, let's see, hold on. Somebody, who is this? Somebody was asking. Okay, was asking medications for muscle spasms. Generally, the, uh, for smooth muscle spasms, you're going to do a smooth muscle relaxant like ditropan or detrol, also known as oxybutynin. I don't remember the generic, the generic name or the scientific name for the detrol, but oxybutynin is ditropan. That would stop a smooth muscle or help reduce smooth muscle spasms. So your bladder is composed of smooth muscle. That's different than a pelvic floor. Pelvic floor is strided muscle and strided mu skeletal muscle. That needs a skeletal muscle relaxant, and that's going to be flexoril, valium, baclofen. Meredith says, if I did Elmer on by installation only, will I be susceptible to the macular degeneration? Um, you know what? We don't have, they don't have the research one way or the other to be able to answer that. What I can tell you is researchers for topical medications tend to show that topical medications like Elmer, like, um, um, uh, estrogen, uh, topicals tend to stay confined in the localized tissue. And I think the assumption would be that that would be the same for, that um however i you know i mean if you had a big wound in your bladder that allowed elmeron to get into your bloodstream you know it might be another issue uh, i can just tell you the topical is considered much safer than oral therapy but that's a good question and i and we just don't have the answer for that yet you guys if you found this if you found this meeting helpful please make sure you come on over to our website sign up for our free newsletter uh, uh, become a member. You can get our magazine, which I work my butt off on, uh, with our writers, um, uh, you know, and support us. And you, the way you support us is by buying stuff through our, our store. Listen, we almost last year, we, I might've had to shut down the IC network. It was real scary, uh, for a couple of months. Thankfully we pulled it out in the end, but Everybody's hurting for money. So if there's any way you can support us just by buying your key products, like your books from us, that would be great. What healing modalities and theoretical frameworks represent the best fit for IC? Carrie, his whole book is about that. Um, I, you got to have a more specific question than that. I mean, his entire book, 400 pages is on healing modalities, on um, education and healing modalities. Joan, you can rewatch this on YouTube or on Facebook. Denise says, is DMSO therapy still utilized? Yes, but to a much, much lesser extent. Um, uh, because, you know, um, I mean, you know, DMSO is like the, Oh God, I hate to say it that way. It just, it just like, uh, I'm looking for the right way to describe it. Um, I mean, it's, it's like a, I think doctors look at it as a tried and true therapy that's been around for a long time, but you know, there's conflicting research. We have research that shows that it might cause irreversible muscle spasm, that it could make muscle tension tighter. Um, at DMSO, that research was presented two years in a row at the American Urology Association back in the mid 1900s. I mean, 19, you know, I mean, sorry, mid 1990s, 1995 to 2000, probably in there. I have those studies linked in our discussion of DMSO on our website, but it's really fallen out of favor because the heparin lidocaine rescue installations give patients immediate comfort, whereas DMSO can be irritating. And frankly, DMSO stinks sometimes. If you walk out of it smelling like garlic for a couple of days. Um, you know, so, so DMSO has definitely fallen out of favor. I don't think it would be approved today as, uh, I don't think it meets the standard, you know, today of, you know, a really successful therapy, but it's not terrible, but you know, it just is what it is. It's been for around forever. 
you know, again, you you consider the question, which is the biggest subtype? Remember, when GMSOD was developed, everybody assumed this was a bladder disease. So it was a bladder therapy. Now we know or have strongly believe or have much more evidence to suggest that for many of us, it's a muscle issue and muscle tension causing pain that's overwhelming the nerves in the spinal cord, getting referred nerve dysfunction back down into the bladder, which is then causing the release of cystic P and um, uh, a histamine release, which is triggering bladder wall breakdown. And, and so if we're following that model, the appropriate therapy is muscle therapy to release the blood vessels, to restore the health of the muscles so that they're not flooding the spinal cord and triggering this reflex action back down in the bladder. Yeah, I, I had it done six or eight times and the worst mistake I ever made, I will tell you by far, was uh, trying to drive home with DMSO in my bladder. Oh my God, I was an idiot. I should have just sat there for 30 minutes and peed it out. Said I, I drove home with it and having DMSO in your bladder driving over bumpy country roads, do not make that mistake. Hegas says, I want to become a paying member. I wasn't able to sign up through my mobile phone. I will try through your laptop. So heck, just sign up for the $25 membership and you get it all by email and you don't have to worry about international shipping if you want. And then you can print it out. It's a PDF file. Very cheap. Terry says, I have to tell you, Jill, 40 years ago, a urologist said you have ulcers in your bladder, gave me four treatments and I was in remission for 38 years. It stinks. So, so Terry, the interesting thing is, is, you know, and that's something that the Europeans have over over the United States is that the doctors in in Europe are, you know, I think much better trained at how to uh, identify a hunter's lesion uh, effectively uh, because in Europe you have to have a hydrodistension and you have to have a biopsy to even be diagnosed. In the United States, it's a diagnosis of exclusion and you don't have to have the biopsy or the hydrodistension. And I think it's really fair to say correctly that a lot of doctors really don't know how to properly, a lot of urologists don't know how to properly uh, uh, diagnose a hunter's lesion. Um, so I, I would doubt that. I, I, I actually, I mean, I don't know who, who did it. It'd be very interesting to know who made that diagnosis. Was it one of the top guys? Joan says, do you think my local library will carry this book you're talking about only if somebody donates it? You can tell them about it and they will be able to buy it from us. So you could take the title and tell it and, and tell them about it and then they can buy it through us and we will send it to them for you, Joan. But give me a week, give me, you know, three or four days, try to get it up. Okay. Terry Lynn, Terry Lynn said they knew nothing about diet or anything. Yeah, that's because 40 years ago, they really didn't know about diet. Uh, Terry says, oh my gosh, my brother and sister alternated taking me to the installations. My sister got out of the car gagging. Yeah. Hello, Rhonda. Noel says, I'm seeing somebody for dry needling this week for tight muscles. How do you feel about dry needling? Dry needling is remarkably successful at breaking up trigger points. Uh, it's the first line. I mean, it's the second line. First line breaking, breaking up trigger points is uh, fingers touching it. And if your finger's touching it, cannot break up that trigger point, your next step is dry needling. Uh, and, and it's very, very successful. And if it's too painful, what they can do is they can do a trigger point injection. But like I have, I talk about this, I have a trigger point. I know my earring's kind of big today. I have a trigger point. Where is it? Right here. And it's like the size of an almond. And it's been here for 25 years. And of course I have TMJ on this side and I would love, love, love to get this trigger point broken up. It doesn't hurt, but I can definitely tell that my neck muscles, you know, are tight and they're affecting my, my TMJ, which again, they, they point right back to potentially scoliosis and a foot dysfunction, creating this complete imbalance all the way up the body. It's fascinating. Joan, hot nerve pain, uh, circ circumferentially? 
after using a carpet cleaner today. Egads, girl. I hope you feel better. Thank you, Elizabeth. I will get the book up as soon as I can. Yeah, Terry, any, again, anybody, if you love to write and you want to do stuff like that, please, you know, I see network at Mac.com. We are in this together, my friends. You know, this is not the Jill show. This is the we show we have, you know, this is all of us together working together to try to give us each other hope and comfort and strength and all that sort of stuff. All right, my friends. Well, listen, I think it's, I think we can call it. It's time for me to go take a walk in heavy wind out there. Uh, you have homework. I'm giving you homework. Your homework. This is your homework. Homework number one is 15 minutes a day. Let me look up here. For 15 minutes a day, do something for your bladder or your pelvic floor. Whether it's following the diet, doing your stretches, getting out and walking. Come on, do it. Do it. 15 minutes a day. I'm not asking for big things. We're not trying to make a sudden giant change in your life. We're trying to build a foundation. We build foundation with small, consistent steps of health and success. So every day, number one, do something for your bladder or for your pelvic floor or both. Number two, do something for your spirit. Come on, give yourself, you need comfort. You need comfort. This is hard. This is deeply, deeply distressing to have pain and have it unexplained. And, you know, I, 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 uh, I love reading, um, I read a lot of fantasy books and I love shifter books. I love the books about, you know, the people that become wolves or panthers or lions or whatever like that. And anyway, the book I'm reading, all, all, all the shifters, the, uh, that what they do is, is that touches everything that to get comfort, they get hugs, you know, that they, you need comfort from the people around you and you need comfort. So give yourself comfort spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And so for 15 minutes a day, do something that we give you comfort spiritually, whether it's taking a walk, whether it is going to church, listening to Joel Osteen, whatever, do something that just gives you, helps you be centered. Um, and then do 15 minutes for your noggin, your homework when you get this book, one chapter a day, or maybe one chapter a week. But I think don't jump around, don't just jump to the IC section. Come on, you got to learn. You got to learn your anatomy. This is not school anymore. This is all about you understanding how and why you are struggling with pelvic pain. You need to study this, not with resentment, with, but with appreciation. This is a great investment of your time. Fascinating. And yes, you're going to put it down after 15 and 20 minutes and go, oh, shit. Oh, my God, I didn't know that. Come back to it. Keep coming back to this book and read it all the way to the end. Section on uh, the last the last chapter on persistent genital arousal disorder. Absolutely fascinating. You know, section on anal, perineal, tailbone, orgasm. It's just great. It's absolutely great. For 15 minutes a day, my friends, for 15 minutes a day, I want you to do something that makes you laugh. And this is where the internet shines. Go on over to YouTube or go on over to TikTok and watch funny things. I like watching Mr. Beast videos. He's a streamer who does funny gives give, giveaways like he gave away a Lamborghini. Uh, hysterical. Just do some, do some things that are fun. I, laughter helps your brain modulate pain. Pain that is accompanied by laughter is minimized. Pain that is accompanied by tears is intensified. So try to bring laughter back into your daily life. Commit one random act of kindness to somebody you love and commit one random act of a kindness for somebody in your daily life. Kindness rules. Kindness rules. Let's bring some kindness back to this world, right? Especially now. It's so divided. Sue, girl, I hear you. All right, guys, be well, be well. Academy Awards tonight. Yeah, baby. Okay, talk to you later. All right, YouTube, I will see you guys later.